Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Arlington Board of Selectmen's meeting for October 27th, 2014. It is a little past 7.15, and I do call this meeting to order. I would like to remind everyone that we are being filmed by ACMI, so please smile widely when at the microphone. And also, we have some hearing assistance devices. Um, if anyone is in need, please talk to Marianne about that. Um, so let's get started. We, um, if you are looking at the agenda, we are going to move um, a couple things around. We're going to start with um, item number 10, which is a proclamation for Arlington Recycles Week. And we are going to move agenda item number four to the end of the meeting, which is the Selectman's Handbook, because that's more of an internal issue. And I'm sure you all don't want to hear that discussion. Um, but either way, let's get started. Uh, Gordon Jameson. Yes, uh, as we discussed with Mr. Byrne um, beforehand, uh, we're going to uh, dispense with the proclamation so we can promote recycling and do a quick recap for the board. Um, this is sort of our annual song and dance in that regard. Um, actually, I think this is the 10th year we've had this proclamation. So we've been working at this a long time. And we want to thank you for your ongoing and continued support and also the support of the residents in this regard. So each year uh, around the time when there's America's Recycles Day, which is November 15th every year, we um, many years ago started declaring it Arlington Recycles Week. We started off at first handing out bins in what was the predecessor of the Community Collection Day, which we'll get into in a second. But over that period of time, we reduced our solid waste that we burn at the North over Andover um, incinerator by one third, saving the town over two and a half million dollars. Um, we're at 40% diversion, so municipal solid waste is, is, the, is the sum total of solid waste, your trash, plus your recycling, plus your yard waste. So 40% of the total in the town of Arlington is diverted to recycling or composting for the yard waste. Um, the board has agreed to a 50% target, um, which would require another couple um, thousand tons for it to be taken out of the waste stream, and that would save us an additional $150,000 a year. So how do we go about doing that? We had a great uh, increase in uh, great reduction in solid waste when we sw switched the new provider, JRM. We lost about, we reduced our tonnage by about 2,000 tons just by switching to that and have weekly recycling and requiring recycling. Uh, so Community Collection Day is one way of doing that and I provided the board with a handout about the materials that people can see at the website. Um, there's a very nice uh, collection of materials there. This happens each, um, fall and spring. The fall one is November 15th from 9 to 11 at the DPW yard on Grove Street. Don't come early, don't come late. Um, I, and I mean it because otherwise you're in a line out to Mass Ave and if you come late we're sh they're closing up shop because the DPW staff has other things to do. Um, we take clean clothing, books and toys for children. Um, bicycles for Bikes Not Bomb with a small donation to ship it to overseas either to a family where this would be their sole transportation or people in uh, inner city Boston. Uh, E-waste, if you can't make it to the um, EW, DPW uh, office on, in the yard off Grove Street during uh, normal business hours, you can drop off your e-waste. Um, there's a small fee for monitors and laptops. Paper shredding, people love the fact that you can bring two boxes of personal items to be shredded for free. Um, they're either locked up and shredded off-site or shredded on-site. The off-site is better because we don't have to listen to the noise all day. Bottles and cans. The high school group uh, raises their environmental group, raises their funds for their work that they do by collecting returnable bottles and cans. They uh, do three or four hundred dollars each, each weekend in the spring and fall, so that it's good for them. Uh, we've got a new one. You, you should go on the website to look at this rigid plastic. So those rigid plastic toys, those wheel go things, and we now bring those and those will be recycled. Um, a big hit over the last couple of years has been um, foam, you know, styrofoam. Again, look to the website. Um, each of them have to have the right numbers and don't separate your Ed card tops and bottoms because the numbers is only on one half. Um, scrap metal, another one, uh, uh, one of the DPW guys came up with this idea. So this is not appliances, this is like pipes and things. It's a nice way for people to get rid of that. Um, Rechargeable batteries, not car batteries, not alkaline. Alkaline are not toxic. They can go in the regular trash. Those are accepted. Uh, textiles, again, textiles can be taken to many of the recycling bin, uh, bins in town. And sneakers are being collected again. And if you want to work on getting people to help truck those someplace, that would be helpful, Diane. Uh, medications and sharps. 
Uh, we no longer accept medications like we used to in the past. Those are accepted 24-7 at public safety and sharps, and mercury items will collect those. Remember, household hazardous waste is not what this event is about. That is collected at Hartwell Avenue. And even there, they don't want your latex paint because they won't take it. You have to let that dry out. So there's a whole bunch of, um, so the other thing, events we've been doing other than this is, where are my notes? <coughs> is over the last six months, we've had a series of, series of articles in The Advocate and other, other places around town and those, if you go to the Recycling Committee page, you can see a nice uh, presentation of all these different articles. Some of them are about um, all the things you can do um, beyond recycling, um, composting, <coughs> kitchen composting, textiles, foam recycling, rigid plastic, and community, and paper. You can almost always recycle more paper. So, and one of the things that, that we look towards going to the future, and it's going to take some time to get a town-wide service, but individuals can do it, uh, quite an effective job. The next big thing for us to get our tonnage down is compostable kitchen waste. It's wet. Uh, it's not smart to burn water uh, at the incinerator, and people can do it uh, easily. Now, I personally, believe it or not, do not have a composting bin, but I have a nice arrangement with a, a very active uh, couple across the street, and they love to have my kitchen scraps. So I have an old coffee plastic uh, Folgers thing that I put them in as a container and once a week or so I walk across and add to their collection and they're quite happy to have it for their, their garden that they just put in. So there's lots of ways to do it. If you don't have it, you can co collaborate with other people, but that is the next big thing. So we hope that people will not only do textiles and paper and cans and bottles and all those other things, but they begin to think about kitchen uh, recyclable. So that's pretty much my song and dance for the, for the time. Um, go to the website, on uh, the town website. The recycling and trash is now prominent on the front page. You really can't miss it. It practically re leaps out and grabs you, which we're very happy about. It's one of the most uh, oft, oft, often visited sites uh, on the website. And remember, Community Collection Day, November 15th, 9 to 11, at the D DPW Art on Grove Street. Don't come early. Don't come late. Thank you. Thank you, Yes, Warren. Kevin. Uh, Mr. Greeley. Thank you. Uh, do you recycle kids by any chance? <laughs> I thought yours had gotten, gotten old enough to maybe get out of the house I by know. now. <laughs> if you could help with that. I, <laughs> but uh, Gordon, I am interested. Uh, thank you for the excellent work you and all of the recycling committee uh, does uh, for this. Do you have a position on the ballot question related to recycling? I mean the, the bottles? Yeah. Yes, I think what say was, yeah, I, I would personally, um, we, and I believe the committee, uh, is in favor of that. I believe the Board of Selectmen is in favor of that as well. Um, because I missed the last meeting, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. uh, many, years, many years ago, the, vote, the yeah. board did vote to support um, that issue, I believe. Yeah, um, that's before the current recycling process, which we now have with the new trash collection. Right, right. So, yeah. so the fact of the matter is, um, uh, my understanding is the ones that have deposits that um, 75 to 80 percent of those are are recycled, and the ones that don't is 25 percent. So, um, despite the fact that we have the recycling, hmm, pardon? It would increase the recycling. It would you think? no. More importantly, it would reduce our tonnage. It would save us money, because those things will get, be taken out of the trash stream, oh, and um, that that is um, that to me is the biggest savings that will be happening around the state. Is that every every city and municipality in the in the state will instantaneously save money on their trash disposal. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you that is our focus over the years. <laughs> Mr. Kira. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Jameson. Thank um, you, Mr. I did have a question on the textiles. You mentioned here clothing, bedding, and shoes are recyclable. Now, we're not talking about clothing for resale. You're, you're literally talking about recycling the materials themselves. Yeah, so the stuff that, that is, is, is used up, we ask people to bring to the Planet Aid type bins or the stop yeah. and shop because they, they actually, what, what they find unacceptable in those locations, they, um, they sell to people that turn it into the sound insulation for your automobiles. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that fiber gets, gets redone into that or redone into other things where it can be used. Yeah. The types of um, materials we, are, we wish to collect are um, lightly used things that can be resold at the Little Fox. Um, or donated to um, uh, locations like that. So this is this is this is still usable materials uh, okay. that are that are lightly used 
not things that have been used up. The used up ones we really um, prefer people bring to one of those other locations. Okay, so you really you are where it's, where for, it's the for fiber, resale. where it's yeah. the fiber that and and, and Julie Brazil, uh, the other co-chair, wrote, wrote a very nice article that is one of those articles that was in the Advocate. Yeah. Um, that's also available on the recycling page that people can learn more about there. Yes, but thank you for that question. Great, thank Same you. Same with the toys. It's for um, you know doing good by while well, doing good by helping out all these different organizations. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jameson. Any thank other you. discussion from the board? Is anyone else in the audience here to speak on this matter? Seeing none. Yes. I move approval on the proclamation. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I have nothing. Thank you. Thank you much, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, Bye. Moving on, uh, for approval, bond sale, general obligation bonds, uh, bonds Mr. Gilligan. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm here this evening to ask that you approve the bond sale that was recently conducted uh, on behalf of the town. We sold uh, $12,218,000 worth of bonds uh, on October 15th. There were seven bids. Uh, they all occurred within seven and a half minutes wow. um, due to the age of uh, modern technology. Uh, I'm pleased to report that Morgan Stanley was the winning bidder. The coupon rate for the bonds was 3.12%, which is a great rate in and of itself. However, uh, the news is better than that. Uh, we received a premium of over a million dollars, which nets out to a total interest cost of 2.11% for that $12 million issue. So it's good news all the way around. Um, if the board has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, as I said, it's one of the larger bond issues that we've had over the years. The only one that topped that was a $14 million issue a couple of years ago. This takes care of all the capital projects that were voted at town meeting, including the water meter replacement. You may note in the memo that I gave you earlier, we are actually borrowing less than what was authorized by town meeting. Uh, given the town manager's acumen and the director of public works ability to do certain work in house. So we were able to cut the cost, the borrowing cost of $800,000. Um, I am prepared if the need arise and the manager so informs me that we'll be able to uh, conduct a short note borrowing for that $800,000 if need be. Uh, you'll also notice that there were two votes taken at town meeting for a water facilities improvement project and a sewer facilities improvement project. We are not borrowing money for those two projects. We've been informed by the MWRA that the town will be eligible for a new grant and loan program that they're about to come out with. So we're saving on borrowing costs as well as that. Uh, and that will most likely be a 75% loan and a zero, I'm sorry, 75% grant and 25% zero interest loan. So across the board, we're doing very, very well. Um, and that's about all I have, except one, one note in, in being prepared for Mr. Greeley's question <laughs> as to how much having a AAA rating sa sa saves the town with this particular issue, given the dumple bump up that we uh, achieved back in 2008, the town will save $194,605.34. And that's just for this issue alone. We've saved considerable sums of money every year that we've gone out to borrow. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Excellent job as always. So, Steve, what did the one million premium, why did we say that? What, what, what happens that happen? is in a bidding process, to be competitive and not to um, cut the rate too high, bidders will not bid too low. But to win the business, they will pay the town a premium, which means they pay us cash, I see. which drives the interest cost, the net interest cost down. Yeah. So instead of a, a co the coupon rate, which is what will appear on the bonds, is 3.12%. But the cost to the town, because of the cash payment, nets out at 2.11%. It's an incredible savings to the town. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mahan. Move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. <coughs> Excuse me. Any further discussion from the board? Any further discussion from the audience? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the members of the board, and I wish you uh, good luck in signing those 30 pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Moving on. Presentation, solar installation on town property. Uh, Ruthie Bennett, the regional energy manager, and Amoresco representatives. So I'm just, I'm going to give a brief intro if that's oh, all right. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. please. 
so we have with us tonight Ruthie Bennett, energy, man uh, energy manager for the town, or regional energy manager for Arlington and Bedford, as well as some representatives from Amoresco. Um, and as the board knows, Arlington's been a green community since 2010. It's been interested and involved in energy efficiency measures since well before that. Uh, and we, we've had a lot of efforts towards green initiatives. Uh, one area that we have not made a lot of progress on is renewable energy. So that's sort of the next frontier for us. Um, I, I should say we did make some progress with renewable energy on private residences in the past several years, but not on town property. Uh, so going back earlier this year, um, Ruthie applied for a grant from the state for owner's agent technical assistance to help us begin the process of working with a solar developer to potentially put solar panels on school and town buildings. We were awarded that grant, started working with the Cadmus Group to help us look at two regional procurements that we were part of and decide what solar developer we wanted to work with. Through that process, the town decided to work with Amoresco, and Amoresco is now working with Cadmus and with Ruthie looking at a number of buildings in town, as well as a couple parking lots for potential solar installations. I know the board has a presentation before them tonight uh, with some sketches of the roofs that are being looked at, uh, but we wanted to take this opportunity for the folks from Amoresco to introduce themselves to the board, talk a little bit about the process they're following, looking at buildings in town, and then answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So, Ed. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Ed Lapori. I'm a senior account executive for <coughs> Amoresco in the Business Development Group. And also representing Amoresco tonight, to my left is Jerry Cantor, Project Development Manager, and Jim Walker, our Vice President of Solar Photovoltaics. I'm going to give you just a quick background on Amoresco. Amoresco was incorporated in 2000 and went public on the New York Stock Exchange in 2010. And in 2013, Amoresco had an annual revenue of $574 million. Amoresco has over 900 employees um, in, 34, uh, in 60 offices, 900 employees in, in 34 states and five Canadian provinces. We're corporately located in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, Jerry is prepared to give a brief update on the solar photo photovoltaic project, where it stands now, and, and what we'll be doing moving forward. Jerry? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I understand you have in front of you this presentation, <coughs> so I will go through the sites that we are looking at briefly and then take any questions you have. First, let me say that the numbers that you see here are preliminary. This is the result of our initial screening process, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Um, so they are subject to change. The engineering process is still ongoing. <clears throat> the first school you see here, the Arlington High School, uh, as a result of our initial screening, we anticipate that the production, the kilowatt hours, might be around 200,000 annually. To give you some context, in the fiscal year 14, the high school used about 1.5 million kilowatt hours. For the, so that's about 13, 14 percent. For the middle schools and then elementary schools, on an annual basis, they might use around 300,000 kilowatt hours. So depending on the site, it might be one third to say 40, 45 percent of annual production or consumption for the schools. So as I said, these are preliminary numbers. As an initial screening, our engineering team will go out to the site. Um, and they'll use aerial photography and take a look at a couple of things. So first they're looking at the space available for solar panels, and they're also looking at shading. Too much shading means the production will be low and we don't want to put panels in a location like that. So that might include shading from trees, it might include shading from nearby buildings, and it might include shading from rooftop structures such as air handling units, et cetera. Um, the systems on these rooftops, to tell you just two things about them, one, they're low profile. So they might be, a, when engineering is all said and done, maybe at about a five degree angle to the plane of the rooftop, possibly 10 degrees. Second, they're ballasted. So that means they are sitting on top of the rooftop, they're weighted down, they do not penetrate the roof. <coughs> and there's a membrane in between the ballast and the panels and the roof itself. So the roof is protected, the roof warranty is not voided, et cetera. What we're in the middle of doing right now is taking this screening level process to a second stage of review 
where we send a structural engineering firm out to the site. In order to actually put panels on the rooftop, we need to know that the roof can take the extra weight. Um, and so we are in the middle of that right now. The engineering firm has been out there. They're going out again tomorrow morning for a final review on two of the schools. Um, we did review four or so other small sites, the DPW building and a couple of other schools. I say small, what I mean is that there was not a lot of availability for solar panels. Um, and so low capacity means it's going to be a, a higher cost. And so right now they have been removed off of our, um, our list of sites. There's a potential for putting uh, canopies over a couple of the parking lots. We are looking into that as well. Um, we anticipate working with Ruthie and the town and having a contract signed by the end of the year. Um, construction would take place in the spring or summer next year. And we'll work with the schools around the school schedule so we um, keep disturbance to the students to a minimum. For instance, we can work around MCAS dates. We can do as much of the construction as possible in the summer, et cetera. Any questions? I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Mr. Kira. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the, uh, the presentation here. I, I had a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I, I see the first year production estimate, 678,059 kilowatt hours. On each of the buildings, how does that, I mean, off the top of your head, how does that match up to the, um, the actual demand um, within those so buildings? So the actual annual consumption? Yes. So it would be about 13 or 14 percent of the high school, so the 200,000 for the high school. Yeah. Um, for the middle school and elementary schools, um, we can look at actual data, but it is approximately 45 percent on the middle school, give or take, and maybe about a third for some of the smaller systems. So you're never in a situation where you're selling back to the grid or? Uh, um, it's unlikely. It's possible in the summer um, off hours that you could be selling back to the, the grid. The way it works, though, is these systems aren't going to produce more than the schools are using overall over the course of the year. Yeah. So you actually get a credit on your bill. It's called a net metering credit, virtual net metering. Um, and we don't anticipate uh, exceeding what the town could monetize for net metering credits with this production. Okay. Um, how long do, do you anticipate the system, uh, what's the warranty on the systems or the usable life of these systems? So a contract would typically be a, around 20 years with an option for renewal. The usable life of the system is likely longer, 25, 30, even 35 years. Hmm. One of the reasons I'm asking is I see there's a big installation at Arlington High School and I think we all hope and pray that within the next five, six, seven years there'll be major work there. Some of these structures may not even exist anymore at that point. So how easy is it to um, transfer or move? Oh, please come. Yep. Hi, Ruthie Bennett. Um, we've taken into account that not all the roofs will last 20 to 30 years, particularly the high school. So the um, price that we'll pay for electricity includes the fact that there might be some downtime for some of the roofs. Mm -hmm. So the, the price for electricity actually includes a lot of different pieces of information as opposed to now where we just buy a kilowatt hour from NSTAR and they give it to us. This is a whole contract for all the buildings for 20 years okay. and it includes all these issues of maybe there'll be downtime, maybe a roof, if you know if there's a problem with a roof you have to fix it, we take some panels off, we fix it, we put it back. So that's all included in the eventual price that we pay. Uh, in the contract with Amoresco. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Greeley. Yeah, um, that was mine. Are these things, can we get, they be taken off one roof and put on another one? But you're saying it's covered anyhow, even if it, even if it has to be new panels. It's not inexpensive to take them off, but you can take them off if the roof needs to be fixed, or if there's a leak, or if we take down the school and put up a new school. They are m removable. It's not easy, but it's definitely doable. And Amoresco understands that, particularly with the high school. They know that it, we hopefully will have a new high school. Right. And, and it certainly may uh, reach the point where as we negotiate and investigate that we look at the high school and say, okay, it doesn't make sense today to do panels. Let's wait until the construction. But we, have, we still need to see more numbers before we can make that decision. Right. right. So actually in the next sort of two to three weeks, we're really coming down to what the number is going to be for the per kilowatt hour that we're gonna purchase, and that'll help us really tighten up. The high school is a big you know, influence in it because it has such big capacity. But on the other hand, if it's not gonna be here in five years for two years, that really affects the price. So we're definitely you know, keeping that in mind. Right. Could I ask, because I think you're gonna to wanna to answer this next one. Me? Yes. Yeah. 
which is, why not, why should we not, I'm just curious about technology advances. The technology now would produce 200,000. Why don't we sign a 10 year and then maybe in 10 years that technology will produce the million we need? Well, that's actually, I think, more of an Amoresco question oh, sorry. because sorry. they're signing a contract for 20 years and that relates to their financing. So we're really all, all saying we're going to be in this together. We get this really good price as long as we're still having these panels for 20 years and they can take that to the bank and finance it. So yes, maybe in 10 years we wish we would have waited, but we have 20-year guarantee. We have, a, we have a constant number for our electricity costs for 20 years, the assumption being that our friends at NSTAR will be, you know, escalating their prices and we won't have to be hit with that. So, NSTAR? No. Okay, thank you. I'm not bad-mouthing anybody. But, y you know, it, it is a trade-off. Right. But, you okay. know, this is here now. We have, um, we did the procurement uh, two years ago. We have a grant for assistance. It's coming together now, so. Great job. So, what about technology? Is it advancing uh, such that these panels would produce more energy in the near future? Oh, sorry, I don't know. That's fine. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Jim, for Jim Walker. Up, yeah, all right. <laughs> Kevin wants to ask a question from everyone. Well, yeah. I'll answer two, two of your questions, uh, actually. Um, with respect to, to technology, it's just like computers, right? You didn't have iPads 10 years ago, but that didn't stop you from buying a computer 10 years ago. But the difference is that a solar panel system costs many millions of dollars. So we could pay it off in 10 years, it would just mean a higher electricity price now. And so most communities prefer a really low price that they have for 20 years, especially given all the volatility that they face in school budgets. That's, that's mainly what the municipalities are concerned about. And we can offer that low price that gives them the most savings by going out 20 years. As far as, um, you had also asked about roofs different municipalities do it different ways so we just our first solar pv system was in the uh, city of newburyport and that was the first in the commonwealth of massachusetts that was under a power purchase agreement and it was the first that was done under net metering and it was done six years ago and it was on the knock middle school and they decided that they're going to replace part of the roof the way that they preferred to do it was they preferred to include the uh, removal and replacement of the panels in their contract with their contractor. So we just supervised it and made sure that they uninstalled it properly and reinstalled it properly. But they included that in the solicitation that they had and they determined that, that was their least expensive way to do it. So different municipalities do it different, different ways. Right. Thank you. And I understand, so just, uh, I understand the cost and thank you for that explanation. But what about the technology here? Does it you know, like no you doubt said, the technology will change, yeah. and um, you could have a 10-year contract. It will be a higher electricity no, price. No, I understand. Yeah. Right. But I, I, I just don't Technology know. is definitely changing and will change. Okay. I thank expect. You. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I hope, anyway. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Thank Dunn. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. A um, couple questions, I guess. And um, first of all, I'm not sure if it's for Ruthie, the town manager. Uh, the, um, the coordination with the schools, how is that working? or what's happening with? So uh, a, a lot of the discussions about this happen around the energy working group table of which the school CFO uh, is a member. And Excellent. this group that's before you here tonight will be going to the school committee next week? Two weeks. Two, two weeks? Uh, so, so we are coordinating with the but schools. But the school, having the school CFO at the regular conversations really probably Absolutely. answers most of what I was after there. Thank you. Um, what parking lots are we looking at or is that not really, or how does that work? So we're looking at the DPW yeah. parking lot um, and the one on, um, on Mass Ave and Water Street, I think it is, the municipal one behind, I can't remember the name of the restaurant. The Russell Common lot. Say it again? The Russell Common lot. Right. Okay. Right. Well, I'm sorry, we, what are we talking about? We're oh, going to Water put Street. a roof over the Russell Common? No, 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 no I, I said the wrong one, the Water Street lot, the Water railroad Street lot. Parking the railroad lot. lot. But still, it's a roof with these panels on it. We're going to look at the it? numbers. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, we could send you a picture. You could Google it. But it basically is, you know, a tall pole with holding the panels, oh, okay. and it's tall enough so that all the DPW trucks can get underneath it. I mean, it's it's you know clears everything. What's interesting is that it shades the cars. It also yep. keeps the snow off the cars. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's got a lot of value. I've been waiting. Just putting it on a parking lot is. You know, I've been waiting for them to install those in Ale Life. I'll be a happy man when they do that. <laughs> um, yeah. And I guess my last one also, again, maybe Ruthie or uh, town manager. So tell me more about how, like, 
what does this mean financially in terms of a process? Like, is this just no, no cost to us and it just happens and, it, and we just pay the cost for electricity? Is there a capital outlay? What would be the competing model that we'd look at? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that you had it right. I mean, okay. this is what's great about this you know, 20 year relationship is that it is no capital outlay for us. Um, Amoresco installs them, they pay, the, you know, they pay the purchase price, they pay the construction cost. We have a whole um, set of construction details with them in the, in the agreement. And then we have a new set electricity cost for 20 years. And there's, if there's a shortfall mm -hmm. in the production, there's a, you know, documentation in the agreement, what happens to that, they have to cover it. So it's, but there is no capital outlay for us as a town. And it's fixed just for the portion that's coming from this project. Right, just from the panels, right. So we'll have a bill that's sort of panel cost, and then we'll have the rest with our friends at NSTAR, their cost. Okay. Whatever that may be. <laughs> Thank you. I can go after you. You might ask my questions. No. Yeah. I, I guess I just have one more, which is, uh, and you know, I certainly don't need this tonight, but just in the big picture is thinking about how we know whether or not this is the right model for Arlington? Like, how are other towns doing it? How, what towns are they? It's, I always like looking and seeing what, uh, okay. Right, well, actually, I mean, maybe the town manager could speak to that. We were part of a regional procurement to mm -hmm. get this whole relationship, and so we are one of multiple towns who've gone down this road, and we're not the first to have a power purchase agreement. It's, it's more common in municipalities because there is no capital okay. outlay. So yeah. if you want to. Yeah. Okay, I'll listen to the sales guy, but I also want to hear our people on this one, too. No, well, <laughs> sure. Uh, more of an engineer, but in any event, the, um, the way all the municipalities are using power purchase agreements, and there's two reasons for that. One is that it's a lot of money, and they'd rather use, if you had a bond, they'd rather use that bond money for either a new school or, you know, water uh, pipes or whatever, uh, rather than solar panels. And the second is that we, as a, as a company, a private company, can take advantage of the 30% investment tax credit. A municipality cannot take advantage of the 30% investment tax credit. So that gives a, a financial advantage that's available right now. Now, now that's scheduled to go away um, after 2016, or it will be reduced to 10%. So there are mechanisms in, in the federal IRS rules that allow us and the municipality to benefit together uh, through those tax benefits, and that's why all the municipalities are doing it. Okay. Things. I definitely understand that motivation. That makes a lot of sense to me. I just want to make sure that that truly does align with what we're trying to do. So I, I'm like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll quickly say, and I can certainly give you a, a better answer uh, in the future, but I'm not aware of any Massachusetts municipality who has done this without pursuing the PPA because of the high upfront capital investment. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Bond. Just on that, and then I, yeah, if you, you, you might it. have... Just to follow up on that, and I'm going to go from a very shaky memory from two years ago. Um, actually, our former colleague and former state senator, Bob Haven, had contacted me, and I had met with a couple of people from Amoresco. One was a gentleman from Arlington. Um, and at the end of that meeting, I just contacted the town manager. And if my memory was correct at the time, I was told that Lexington was coming on board, that Amoresco was approaching Arlington, Belmont, and a few other contiguous communities. And the reason why I don't have more of a memory than that is I just call, called the town manager who said he was on it. So I was just wondering, is my memory correct that you do, and the reason I'm asking this question is, you know, I believe Lexington, if they hadn't signed on, they already were, were in the process of Arlington and Belmont. I'm thinking of regional projects like Minuteman, like our lab, community schools, things like that. That's where maybe, you know, another, another next step sort of discussion is. So is my memory correct regarding Amoresco and what contiguous communities you are so involved regarding with? Lexington, your memory is correct. Okay. Um, we are completing construction on six sites in Lexington as we speak. And then right, uh, but Lexington did follow a different path. Um, Lexington had a, um, a strong community, um, Energy Committee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they decided to go out for a separate RFP, which we won and were selected. And we're now finishing up that construction. Um, we signed the contract a couple months ago, and we're rapidly finishing that up. We've also done um, in the MAPC region. I don't know if I remember them all. Uh, Melrose. Uh, separately, we've done Waltham. 
I think you got Belmont. I you were in the front. Did you get Belmont? I don't know. Uh, Bel it doesn't matter. I'm just yeah, thinking. I can't the remember, town. but there's a yeah. whole bunch of towns. I can't remember all the towns. Just as a follow up, yeah. in in the future, if there are any regionalization opportunities on investments, whether they base school or DPW services, I'm going to leave it to the town manager and this working committee. That if you know, we do have Arlington, Belmont, Lexington on board. That's another thing we should look at when we're talking about our regionalization goals. But okay. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for being here tonight. This is a um, this can be a pretty exciting project. Um, I do just have two hopefully quick questions. Um, the first is that so say you start implementing these next spring, I think is what you said potentially. Okay. How long would the project take for to them to come online? From start of construction to finish, on the order of three months perhaps. Okay, that's pretty quick. Um, and my other question is, who is responsible for the maintenance costs? You know, wiring faults, uh, bad panels, et cetera. Right, so Amoresco has an in-house operations and maintenance team located in our Framingham office. Um, right now we're doing O&M for about 17 megawatts of projects, uh, largely in Massachusetts. And as, along with that, there is an annual preventative maintenance site visit, um, as well as continuous monitoring of the system. So if there is any issue, we get an automatic alert, an email alert goes to the team, and they'll go out to see what's going on and conduct any repairs as necessary. Awesome. Well, we own the system. Uh, if you could come to the microphone when you. We, we, we own the system, and we are fully responsible for making sure that it operates as planned. And we have banks that we have to satisfy, and they mm -hmm. really want us to make sure that's operating well. I'm sure. Thank <laughs> you. I just want to say from the town point of view, the value to us is, first of all, they totally operate and maintain it. And if it doesn't produce, they're responsible, right? We have an agreement about how much it has to produce. So we don't have to worry and watch because it's really in their interest. That's an aligned interest. So that's one of the values of not owning it ourselves because we don't have that kind of maintenance staff in hand. Thank and you. And in terms of schedule, also, we will work with the schools. So it could be a three-month process, but it also could be a little bit longer in terms of April is MCAS time, and we don't want to do it then. So schedule is a little bit flexible. The goal is to get it done by the summer so it's up and running when school starts. So wanna thank you very much. Yes, Mr. So, um, Adam, let me. What kind? Do you need a motion from us on this tonight? No, th this was strictly informational, to, so that you wouldn't be surprised six months from now when the solar panels were up on a crane somewhere <laughs> being put on top of the school. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further discussion from the board? So, any, any, yep. any questions from the audience, Charlie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Um, <clears throat> This is a 20-year contract, from what I understand. And I, I'd just like to draw the board's attention to the, our recent experience with 20-year contracts or more. Uh, one was Neswick, which was a power contract. And I was here when that, I voted for it, actually, I have to say. Um, actually, it was about 30 years ago, 35 years ago. And um, we couldn't get out of it when the, when the power differential, when the cost of, the differential cost, the cost of power in the market versus what we were paying turned around and went the wrong way. And um, it, as anybody who suffered through town meeting in that period can recall the problems associated with that. Perhaps one of the benefits has been that um, it created the uh, recycling committee that Gordon Jameson heads that seems to work right now. But that's one of the few that I can recall. Secondly, um, I think we're still struggling with the Minuteman contract after 45 years and we can't seem to get out of it. So I would caution the board to be very careful about getting involved in 20-year contracts, especially, I think, your, your question about the technology changing. The other things that can change is the cost of power produced by alternative technologies. So I mean, I'm not saying that this is not a good technology or the price isn't right, but I'm very concerned that we get involved in another um, long-term contract with where we don't know what it's going to look like in the future. And then the other question is, is, is this going to go before town meeting? How does the town enter into a 20-year contract committing future town meetings for an expenditure without getting the approval of town meeting? I thought that was a bond or something. Mm. Um, uh, do you have, do you have comment on Mr. The council? Uh, it's really more uh, tantamount to a, <coughs> to a, uh, I don't think it's really tantamount to a bond in the sense that it doesn't commit us to a, to a, to a debt. Um, I'm happy to examine the question more closely, but I... I'm quite confident that uh, one town meeting cannot bind another town meeting except for a bond. 
unless there's a, some sort of special, um, I don't know, some, something. Otherwise, um, the third year in, you know, if you don't get to vote a town meeting on this, it's gone. So I think that's something that you should consider. And then the last question is, what are the exit mm. strategies if we want to get out of this contract? How do we get out? That's a fair question. Mm. The Grinch that stole Christmas, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Um, uh, perhaps the town manager will look into those uh, concerns yeah, and report back. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you all again for being here. That was, oh, we have another hand. Please come forward if you could give your name as well. Hi, I'm Brooks Harrelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Uh, I'm familiar with maintenance repair and operation software for a large system such as this and assume that a company like Amoresco would have a very sophisticated one in place. I'm wondering, I, I'm also aware of the tremendous work that Ms. Mahan has done over many years improving the electricity in, in, uh, in Arlington and I personally am a, a proud recipient of the benefits of that. I would like to know about transparency and reporting. Will the MRO systems for this system be integrated with MRO reporting systems in Arlington? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps you can answer that question. Right. I, I just um, the um, s what we'll provide the um, city of Arlington, town of Arlington, is um, a website. So there'll be transparency. So that and an educational program. So anyone in the town can see how the system is performing on an hour-by-hour hour basis, and there's graphs and charts and all the type of information that are e readily available, as well as the schools. So we have an integrated program with um, help on the curriculum to help the schools look at it. But it's readily available, and all the information can be downloaded. We are under an obligation to the banks, besides an obligation to the um, town, to make sure that these are producing the um, kilowatt hours that we said that they would produce. It's an absolute requirement of our uh, loan uh, for this. So that's why we monitor it. Our own software uh, for the maintenance, well, since we're maintaining, won't be integrated or there's no plan to integrate it because we don't want anyone from the town to go near it, really, except if there's an emergency um, because we have the liability and the responsibility for it. We don't want someone who hasn't been trained to inadvertently do something to the solar panels. Um, so anyway, we, we'll, we take full responsibility for the maintenance and operation of the systems. Thank you. And just to add quickly, I assume you may be online right now or you would have access. If you want, by way of an example, you can go to the City of Newton website. If you click on sustainability on the left sidebar and scroll down to the page, there is a link and up will pop the website, which will be a similar to what Arlington would be offered. And you can see the 15 minute increment, I believe, energy production, as well as the equivalent carbon offsets, um, and also putting it into terms that everyone can understand, number of cars taken off the road from the system compared to general energy production from the grid, et cetera. So Thank you. One last one thing in terms of transparency. There will be a flat screen monitor in each building that has panels on the roof, and this, what you see on the website from Newton will be the same thing that's shown there. So there's a curriculum, but there's also sort of as every student or you know, teacher or principal or parent walks by, it'll be obvious what it's producing. The, the maintenance is different, but in terms of what we're producing for each building, that'll be transparent all the time, not just on a website, but on a, a, a monitor in, in the buildings. Thank you. Um, any further discussion from the audience? Seeing none, no further questions from the board. Thank well, thank you all very much for being here, and um, we look forward to getting responses from Mr. Chaplain on those questions. Moving on, for approval, we have the opening of the 2015 warrant for town meeting. Sorry. Yes, Ms. Mahan. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> move for the annual town meeting taking place on Monday, April 27, 2015 at 8 p.m. that the warrant will open Tuesday, December 2, 2014 at 8 a.m. and remain open until 12 noon on Friday, January 30th, 2015. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion from the board? Any discussion from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Five nothing. 
Um, as I mentioned previously, we will be um, addressing agenda item number four at the end of the meeting. So moving on, uh, the consent agenda. We have the uh, minutes of meetings for September 22nd, 2014. We have a request for a contractor drain layer license, CM uh, Conway Construction. We have a request for a contractor drain layer license uh, from Insight Contracting. And we have a request uh, for the permit for the Veterans Day Parade, which will be held on Tuesday, November 11th. Move approval subject to all conditions as set forth. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on these items? Any discussion from the audience on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Five nothing vote. Um, Moving on, we will now have a public hearing on the disposition of 1207 Mass Ave, which is the former DAV building. And um, you know, we're really just looking to hear um, what your thoughts are on how this building will best serve the town moving forward. Um, we have been hearing uh, correspondence from community members, um, both online and um, via telephone calls. And um, I really, I look forward to uh, having a discussion on this matter. Um, Mr. Chatelain. And just to build on that, Mr. Chairman, um, in the announcement that the town and the board issued, we did allow for residents to be able to send written documentation up until next Monday. Uh, so I would say tonight shouldn't close out the discussion, but begin public discussion. And if anybody wants to submit, anybody at home watching wants to submit something in writing by next week, uh, they could do so. Yes, we'll be happy to consider it. Um, I'll begin. Is there any discussion from the board um, before we get started? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if it might be helpful just in a few sentences to set up for, for, for folks who might be watching at home how we came to this point. <clears throat> sure. Um, so we have a um, group that is meeting on, you know, the, to consider the future direction of the DAV. We had a tour of the facility for the Board of Selectmen, and that committee is made up of myself, um, Mr. Dunn, Mr. Chapdelaine, and um, our former veterans agent, Bill McCarthy. Bill McCarthy. I'm sorry, Bill, uh, no offense on that. Um, and, you know, we decided that this, um, we really were looking for a transparent and open process, and we thought that having a um, public hearing um, to take input would be a great first step in that. Um, this will, um, and I guess the, there are several possibilities, you know, that come to potentially selling the building, leasing the building, um, you know, using it for other town purposes. And um, we really look forward to a robust discussion on that. Um, so please, um, we'll just take, um, you know, take audience members uh, by raising your hands. Um, okay, we'll start with Mr. Harrington and we'll go row left to right and then back that way so we have a system. Thank you very much. Uh, Sean Harrington, uh, Precinct 15. Um, one of the things I was actually really looking at is the idea of more meeting spaces for uh, Arlington. You know, as someone uh, who chairs a local committee here in town, uh, meeting space is, ve is, is a great thing to have. Um, but sometimes uh, places like the Senior Center become very full recently when uh, my group, the Arlington Republican Town Committee, had a meeting at the Senior Center. There was a large uh, event going on in the May Room of uh, a Catholic women's dinner, which is fine, um, but it was, it, you know, with all these different events going on, depending on different noise levels, stuff like that, it sometimes distracts people from the meetings that they are having. You know, people walking through, the, you know, the dining, the, you know, the dinner that they're having to get to this meeting, they're wondering, you know, who we are and we're wondering who they are. Um, I hope that there's a real thought in making this a uh, meeting place and possibly even a place to rent out for weddings or what have you. I know that there's a bar already set up there. I don't know if it'd be possible to, you know, try to renovate it, keep uh, so it's a good meeting place and also a place for functions that the town can rent out and make more money off of and also um, give more meeting space that I think is needed for Arlington residents. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, 
if the board is entertaining uh, an option to sell that property, that real property, um, I would be inclined to support that. I think the property could be returned to the tax rolls and improve the tax levy of the town. But more importantly, I think the board should consider that the proceeds of the sale of real property that's currently owned by the town should be used to mitigate the borrowing for the improvement of other real property within the town, whether it be the Stratton School or Arlington High School. And the proceeds should be used either to mitigate the borrowing, in other words, lessen the total amount to be borrowed with principal, or it should be used for the payment of the debt service for whatever borrowing those projects entail. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foskett. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, <clears throat> I was, along with Jack Hurd and uh, Dennis Sullivan, co-chairman of the Rebuild 2 debt exclusion campaign in uh, 2000. And um, we raised, at that time, through a debt exclusion, $34 million for the rebuilding of the second group of our Arlington Elementary Schools. It's now 2015, and we have not completed the Stratton building. Uh, about a month ago, the school department appeared before the Capital Planning Committee, and uh, after a lot of work that was done by the um, Stratton School Building Committee and some consulting architects came back with a plan for a $10 million project. And candidly, um, knowing the costs over the years and the passage of time and the things that have to be done there, I don't question that number. In fact, it might grow over time uh, looking forward. We have in the capital plan right now, if my memory serves me right from last year, one and a half or two million dollars that we have already sort of programmed in for the Stratton School. So we're looking for another eight million dollars and most of this has to come, most or all of it has to come from our non-exempt budget. So um, following Mr. Gilligan's comments, I would like to put a little more focus and uh, respectfully recommend to the board that um, that, these, that this asset be sold in some fashion or another, and that the funds be used to support the reconstruction of the Stratton School. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we start? OK. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Neil Mongold, uh, 12 Brattle Place. I'm a member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, uh, which um, owns and, and um, promotes affordable housing in Arlington. Um, I would just like to say, encourage the, the board to consider and the town to consider the use of the property as a mixed use property with um, commercial space on the ground floor <coughs> and affordable housing above. Uh, I think that's in concert with what the master planning committee um, has been working on for, for the town, for the main commercial arteries. And um, there is a, uh, there's, a desperate need for affordable housing in Arlington. The Housing Corp of Arlington has over a thousand households on its waiting list, and um, I just wanted to encourage you to consider that as one of the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Richard McElroy. I'm a near neighbor of uh, 1207 Mass Ave. Uh, I'd just like to uh, point out some issues that have to be considered in this whole process. Right now, in that two block area, there are three empty storefronts. I'm afraid that it's not a really viable business area. Uh, this obviously would be a commercial property, and of course there's a concern what kind of business is gonna move in there. Uh, the activities now on that two block area are mostly nine to five style businesses. Uh, it would be detrimental to the neighborhood to have a late night establishment there. Uh, another issue is there is no parking, uh, no uh, lots nearby, very limited on street parking. Uh, again, it may not work out as an appropriate place for a restaurant. Uh, going back to the issue of who actually may buy it, uh, of course, we have to consider if it's sold, there'd be little, very little control over who the buyer would be, and other than through licensing, what kind of activities would go on in that business. If we'd have a lease arrangement, that probably would give the town more leeway in selecting a more appropriate uh, occupant for the uh, establishment. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Thank you very much for having this open forum. My name is Kerry Conrad. I run the Arlington Soapbox Derby. I would really like to see a mixed-use center used in that space. Uh, we would be very motivated to assist the town in refurbishing the space, bringing it up to code, being a very good neighbor to those in the neighborhood. And liquidating an asset is always a very attractive thing to do when trying to meet a budget. I spent most of my career with making these types of decisions. Acquiring this type of asset when you're looking for a solution is infinitely more difficult. You have, we have, as a town, an asset. I think it can be put to excellent use and I would like you to consider that as a possibility. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes. Mr. I, I'm sorry. Could you? I, I understood uh, the argument about um, what, about the acquiring the asset, but I didn't. In the beginning, you were li you led with a suggested use for it, and I didn't. Mixed follow, use. Uh, I didn't so, follow. So rather than just be self-serving and say that the Arlington Soapbox Derby, which is a 77-year-old program, seven years in Arlington, 88 years in existence. We send three people to Akron, Ohio every year. They're children. It's a, the oldest STEM program, the greenest STEM program. Rather than all that self-serving, which I'm sure everyone knows, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, everyone knows about the Arlington Soapbox I could have done that speech from my head, right? <laughs> yeah. But you stick with me for a while and you have it down. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's my suggestion if you're asking me what to put in there. But just for this forum, I think a, uh, the town is in need of a mixed-use facility. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. M moving on to what would now be the third row, Alan Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Alan Jones, Precinct 14, and I hope you don't mind if I read a little bit. I'm not very good at improvising unless I have a Stratocaster in my hand. So, good evening. Thank you for holding the hearing. Uh, I don't think I need to tell any of you what a co-working space is, although there are a lot of definitions that include hacker space and maker space and fixer spaces and uh, office sharing, desk sharing. Uh, and I don't need to tell you that's a great location. It's close to uh, the Heights businesses. It has great access to hardware and lumber and lots of food and the UPS shipping. Uh, the access by foot, bike, public transportation are all really excellent. I'm sure you're also aware of the economic advantages and other benefits to the town and residents of the town of encouraging the development of local innovation economy and stimulating business growth in the Heights. The planning department's been exploring options and looking for ways to the town government to support the innovation economy. We had uh, the planning department held a great seminar uh, a couple months ago about that. And I think the, avail the availability of this property uh, is a unique and timely opportunity for the town to show its support for local innovators and creatives by providing a specific material stimulus and time certain goals with minimal cost and risk to the taxpayers. I'm well aware the property is likely to be sold eventually to support renovations of the Stratton or the high school and I, I'm in support of that. So what I'm asking the board to consider is to delay the sale for let's say a year and give the local innovation economy time to organize, develop, and execute a plan to create a co-working space, demonstrate its economic feasibility, and eventually either buy the property or return it to the town in a better condition than it is now, with presumably a higher resale price. I'm proposing a multi-phase plan that minimizes risk and taxpayer funding, and it has specific milestones which would determine whether or not to proceed to the next step. Phase one would be to initiate the formation of a management group guided by the planning department. My experience is that some form of grassroots cooperative could be the best form, but it could also start with a, uh, the appropriate for-profit business with good experience and funding. Phase two would be to develop a credible business plan that would support the building expenses and operating costs, no doubt through some combination of facility rentals, by the desk, by the hour, by the month, by the office, by the basement. Um, and. Uh, the plan would be based on some very limited period of zero or below market rent from the town. And since the DAV wasn't paying rent or property taxes, there's no immediate loss. And so far, no taxpayer cash has been spent. If the organization comes together and a, and a reasonable plan's made, a business plan that, that makes itself sustaining, 
the first two steps meet their goals, then phase three would be for the town or the co-working group to minimally renovate the property. We know this is class three space. It's good for some things, probably wouldn't be so good for other things. Basically clean out the junk and make sure the critical mechanical systems uh, all work. I don't know exactly what that would take, but since it was occupied fairly recently, I, I've got to believe it's in reasonably good condition and I've walked through and I've seen the space. Um, alternatively, the, the management group could be charged with raising the funds for renovation, either procuring donations, grants, scholarships, prepaid memberships, bank loans if they had a good enough business plan to finance the renovations. Then in phase four, the management group would do a minimal build out with a combination of volunteer labor, donated furnishings and equipment, lots of paint. This is where the group would have choices to make about what the space would best be used for. And it would also put some serious skin in the game. Uh, when you talk to the people who founded Artisans Asylum and Greentown Labs and all the other places, they always started with a community of people really dedicated to it. And this, is the, this would be the turning point. Is this really a, a group that could run it and, and is the enthusiasm there? Um, at the end of a, an agreed upon trial period, the property would be sold, either to the co-working co group if it was thriving or to somebody else at market value. The cost to the taxpayers would be a one-year delay in the availability of sales proceeds and the tax revenues. And I actually look at it a lot like what we did with the Sims property, where we, we, we guide the development of it, make sure that it's something that's compatible with what the neighbors need, what the community needs, what, what the people need. Um, I think it's really it could really have a compatible plan uh, to show that the town does support smart economic growth and the quality of life for uh, many residents. So thank you for considering that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Brooks Harrelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, board. Um, I, I'm speaking as an interested party. I would be a prospective tenant in a co-working space. I have been looking for space for my business in Arlington for three years. I've been looking at co-working spaces and all of the spaces that I find I'm priced out of because they're all for companies that are funded by venture capital. The character of the people who are looking for co-working space in Arlington is very different. They are very small entrepreneurs. They are not venture funded. The, co the price of the co-working spaces are way too large. Having some kind of community support to get it off the ground so these businesses can, can begin to thrive would create, in my opinion, an economic center in Arlington Heights for which I have found no similar opportunity in the three years that I've been looking. Um, in additionally, it has, there are two different groups who have been forming management groups which could come together around such a space as this uh, disabled American veterans space. <clears throat> these, spaces, these groups include small home-based businesses out of Arlington, Belmont, and Medford. They include um, artists and maker space people, and there is opportunity to, inc to put in spaces that could, could be used by, for example, the high school for <clears throat> maker spaces for high school students to encourage innovation in, in the schools. So I'd like to encourage strong consideration of the kind of proposal that Mr. Jones put forward. It seems like now is a very good opportunity, and this is an unparalleled opportunity for the economy, economics of Arlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there someone next to him? Yes, with the hand up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leon Joseph Thorpe. Besides the major of the United States Army, retired. I'm a, a lifelong resident of Arlington, graduated in 1967. Uh, member of disabled American veterans. The property was uh, acquired by the Arlington Selectmen on 1 January 1901. Uh, I was given over in lease for a 99 year lease to the DAV, or the, actually the Arlington Veterans in 1934. Uh, because the state DAV weren't, wasn't being appropriated to their money that they wanted to take out of our club, which was unprecedented, uh, they wanted to, re uh, they came to the Arlington to remove our alcohol license. That's fine, but we're still an organization under the National Charter. We left there. We, Arlington has had no, uh, it has cost Arlington nothing to support this building for 100 years. We've taken on that responsibility all told. We were going to go in for adverse uh, possession, but why rock the boat with the town that we all come from and live in? Uh, 
at the property that should still be considered the chief in the, in the Arlington realm, we, the property has no floor. It's got a sawed basement. Right there, it, it, it nixes almost anything else that you want to do with the property. I mean, we've heard people say food pantry, this, that. You can't do it unless you bring the building up the code. Bring it up the code is almost from the quarter million dollar project. So you're better off just dumping it and building something new. Or put all veteran services and other services, town services, into the building. Selling it, the money you're going to get out of that, you could, you open this, if you can open this place up for town services, it's much better. Get the veteran service agent who you, you finally have a decent man in the, in the office there. Uh, uh, Jeffrey is a hard working man. He knows how to help veterans. Uh, and being stuck in the corner where he is is a little tough. He doesn't have any space to be able to bring other veterans in to assist him. You have quite a few veterans in this town. Uh, you can get, uh, housing has their own people, but you have other, other offices here that are crowded and uh, jammed into this, the annex in here. Open it up to, for, for town facilities for them to have something to conveniently use together. That way you don't have any problems. Selling it, uh, it's like selling a card collection. Well, you, you got something for, that's worth $1,000, but in essence it's worth, worth a lot more. You get that $1,000 gone, you're going to make money, it's going to be gone the next day. It's, it, it, you have the property now. It hasn't been bringing in any money for you people ever before. We've been taking over all the expenses, the roof, the new roof, the new this, the that. We, we've covered it all these years. And uh, your, your predecessors, your family predecessors over here, you know, were, were veterans. That's what happened here. When we got in 34, the World War I veterans ran the town. After World War II in Korea, they were still on the selectmen board, and they made sure that uh, they, according to the laws of Massachusetts, they had to give veterans a place to be able to uh, meet, take care of themselves, and bring in people that needed applications and petitions to get their benefits, which is what I do. I'm retired. I have nothing else to do but raise a 16-year-old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been a widower for 15 years, so uh, I'm an ATM machine now. <laughs> I'm, it's something that I, I treasure dearly. And, uh, I would never trade it for a thing. You know, I had to retire from the service, I had to retire from the CIA, the minute her died, daughter, my, daughter, my wife died, but the things I've gotten out of it have been more than what I, I got a lot out of my professional career, but I got a lot more out of my daughter. Hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, she even comes down, she helps us at the, the American Legion, the VFW, and brings her girlfriends and whatnot. Oh, we get it, we're making it a family again. Back when we were a strong club, we had Christmas parties for the town kids. And we had, you know, Easter and Thanksgiving. Uh, we, uh, we've got the manager of the town, the manager of the building and the commander, James Crowley. He was a town employee, retired. And for two months before we got him into work over the VFW, I thought he was going to die because he was there every day making sure things were going. And it's, we have that kind of loyalty to the people in the club. And we, if, the town use it for other offices and whatnot. You've got a good army of people in, in back of it that are going to help. Now we don't need we don't need a compensation. We just need something to do for the veterans. We need some. And the VFW, it's it's a it's a lounge, the Legion. It's a lounge. We need you know we had a lounge there in the DAV, but we had a back room where we made sure we got went over uh, problems, this, whatnot. Once a week, I'm there getting people in. What Bill McCarthy couldn't do, that he didn't have the time to do, because you know he's got a set of situations that he has to work with. Having been a sergeant major, I had to step on a few toes here. But bottom line is, I could slide things by, make sure that our veterans got seen, got upgraded, and got their benefits, so they wouldn't have to live in agony and disability all their lives there. And I know, thank you. I, I know that the other plans for having the building are good business plans. I agree with that 100 percent. But I, I'm not the best speaker in the world. But the bottom line is, are the veterans still 
I was shot seven times in one afternoon. And I needed that place to go to make sure that my head was halfway screwed on straight, you know? We've all put our time in to do things that the nation wanted from us. We didn't care about the politics, nothing else. We wanted to come home and be with our family again. We fought for each other to be there. But we had a loyalty to this country to do what we did. And uh, I somewhat feel a little, uh, a little hurt by the fact that now all of a sudden everybody wants to jump on a piece of property and get, get, with the, get the quick cash and walk away. You know, and you may not do that. You may put it in for, for another use, but to put it in for commercial use is going to be very difficult because whoever takes it over is going to bring it up the code. Very expensive. I mean, I've, I've got my real estate license, had that for years. I appraised the property. It's going to cost almost quarter million dollars to bring it up the code to do anything. I mean, that basement in the, downstairs, it floods every year, up to three and a half feet. Without a, without a flooring, that's, that's gonna, what's going to happen. Uh, the roof, we've replaced twice in the last 22 years. It gets expensive, but we've taken care of it, and I'm sure the town appreciates that too. And if the town can think about using it in some way, that I'd love to see the veterans agent moved over there and a few other officers moved over there. Now, if we can't use it, we're more than happy to help the people that are using it. You know? So, if you could take my suggestions under, under your hat, I'd be the three of you. Thank you, sir. I didn't bring a whole lot of them. Make sure the chairman gets one yep. for sure. Make sure he gets one for the chairman. The chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, I thought he had limited ones. Mm. Thank you, sir. I do the same thing Jeff does, and I do my best. And uh, I hope you guys consider what I said. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much, you sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your support. Yes, sir. Thank you for allowing me. Yeah, please. Uh, is there anyone else in back in that same row as that gentleman who would like to discuss this? Yes, come forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and board. Um, I first came to know about this property, uh, and I think I actually met you. Um, the gentlemen were taking down their pictures and their awards um, the day uh, I went in there to uh, rent for the excuse property. Excuse me, sir, not to interrupt. Can you uh, give your name? Oh, sorry, uh, it's Eric Love. Okay, Eric. And uh, I'm a part of this community. I work with middle school and high school youth. Okay. I was getting to that point. <laughs> sorry. So I was looking for um, a space for... Uh, for to work with middle school and high school youth in an after school enrichment program to have kind of self discovery, think Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, meets theater and arts. Um, and I went to this space and I, I did see these gentlemen having to take down their pictures and their awards, and it was heartbreaking to see the elders of our community um, losing the one place they can go to relate to each other because maybe because of the experiences they've had. You know, they're not, we've had different experiences than them and that they need a space to come together. Another thing that has brought me here today, though, is one of my students also said, we need a space for kids to come together. And there, there is just isn't spaces. We do rent at the senior center and space is very limited there. We do go to the Fox Library, we do go to the Robbins Library. And in that search to try to find spaces for students, um, I also know Brooks and Allen and I heavily support their theories. Um, I came to know within two emails, 50 artists that are looking to rent for teaching, personal space, or collaborative space, and I have 12 artists that are willing to sign a one to three year lease blindly with any place that I choose because they believe in the mission statement that I put out. Uh, so that, those are a lot of numbers, and these, these, aren't just, these aren't young people, it's mostly people older, older than 30 and 40, some of them are retired, some of them are not. But as Alan was pointing out, places like um, Artists' Asylum um, has really brought in a huge economic development interest into the city. So you're looking at you know, Cambridge and Somerville. What does Somerville have happened in the last three or four years? And all the technology people are moving there. And it's creating more interest in, ra in raising the, the land and the property of the land. So we all know that artists come in, something gets developed, and then the land property goes up. I live in South Boston. I don't live in Arlington. 
but I do live in the distillery building, and I can tell you that there's million-dollar condos going up 20 at a time every month, and they're just three bedrooms. Um, so I took some notes on here. We had, you know, one, two, three, four, five for a meeting space, a place where people can come together for events. Uh, maybe there's some, you know, in the basement, there's some offices, rooms, creative stations. However, as much as I like to push forward my own beliefs and this project I've been working on for over a year with Arlington residents, I do feel that the, the veterans need a space to be. And if there was a way to come to some kind of mutual understanding of maybe we create a place that enshrines 21st century skills and STEM type research and has a lot of fun tools and the veterans could be a part of that process as well, enabling them with new ways to communicate and express themselves. And I feel like a marriage of that sort might be beneficial for everyone. Because I would like to see um, generational bridging happen. There's, there's a gap with generations, and people are losing the importance of eldership. And maybe that doesn't come out in the numbers, but I think for morals and trying to give children and ourselves moral compasses, it's important to put elders back in front of the children, and therefore that will close the bridge between elementary, middle school, high school, adults, and elders. And I know this because I've been doing it for the last 10 years, and it works. If you put them in the same building, they have the same interest, they automatically start talking, and then you have people sharing stories. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further discussion from the audience on 1207 Mass Ave? Seeing none, any discussion from the board? Also seeing none, so. No, no. Oh, yeah. There is, I, I'm just um, curious, first of all, has the subcommittee actually um, reached a recommendation on this yourselves, or were you waiting until no, we, um, we pass we were, through this um, uh, public hearing process? We, we were waiting to hear from the public, and we wanted to have a discussion before making any official recommendations. Okay. Um, and if that process is still <clears throat> still going on and will be going on for the next uh, week or so as you know more ideas come into town before we uh, meet again and try to put together a recommendation I assume okay I also had a question which I, I think is for town council um, <clears throat> my understanding is that if the board were to move forward with a recommendation for a sale we would have to do that through the context of town meeting um, which would mean a, a two-thirds vote of, of town meeting uh, to put it up for sale. And then, of course, we know we have the period afterwards. We wait for the Attorney General's approval. And then, of course, there's a, a long period. Presumably, appraisals are involved uh, before things can, can go up for market. So has there been any analysis, I don't know who to direct this to, but of what <clears throat> a time frame would look like if the board were to pursue a sale um, option? a realistic time frame. So uh, in addition to some of the things that you've outlined, a disposition of the property, uh, most dispositions of the property, would also require us to follow the 30B process. So we'd have to put, um, uh, e even for um, a sort of uh, public good use, we'd still have to put it out for a uh, disposition um, RFP process, sale or lease. And um, we might be able to, and there's a lot of different options that have been discussed tonight, and if the board were to take any of those options, uh, they would have different nuances. But you'd first have to go through that process, and then you'd basically have uh, a contract contingent upon town meeting's approval, and uh, usually the attorney general's office um, completes its review of town meeting sometime um, in August, September. It depends on how much work they have, um, it may be a little bit different for uh, approving uh, a disposition as opposed to a warrant article. It might be able to give us news a little faster than that, but it, it'd, be up, it'd be up to them. Okay. I, I'm just asking this um, because I'm trying to synthesize. We've heard a lot of good um, testimony tonight. I'm trying to synthesize everything that, that we've heard. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I do firmly believe that you sell a capital asset, it is... To, to, to fund another capital asset. So as, as the Capital Planning Committee and Mr. Gilligan have put forth, that if we were to, to pursue the sale, that should be funding 
Stratton or one of our other uh, build projects. But I also heard in Mr. Jones's testimony, he's proposing um, something along the lines of a, of a trial period, which may actually be inherent in this. I mean, that, that the period of time that Mr. Jones referenced might actually be there, the shortest period of time that we could feasibly sell the property anyway. Um, I don't know how long a 30B process takes or what it involves, or if it's needed. Um, yeah. All right, correct me if I'm wrong, but we could do that process before town meeting. That's, yes, okay. exactly, right. exactly. So that, that's, that's one thing that I'm trying to So trying you'd to have to do the 30B process before town meeting. Okay. You have to basically have something lined up unless you were gonna call a special town meeting. You'd have to have basically the agreement in place. Okay, I'm just putting that out there just, just to, to establish that I, I think that a, a trial period like that may be feasible even within the, the bounds of, of pursuing a, a uh, sale. I also want to note something that um, Mr. Mongold said. Um, you're absolutely right. There, there has been um, a lot of discussion within the master planning process around um, uh, multi-use um, uh, multi-use, you know, especially along the commercial corridors in Mass Ave, with some commercial and some residential. You may or may not recall there was an attempt several years ago to um, pass zoning changes um, that would allow more of that within Arlington, and it was it was defeated. But it's been such a, a recurrent theme throughout the master planning process that I I, I have to think that. I can't speak for the advisory committee, but I have to think that, that um, something along those lines is going to be pursued again. And I have to think, and I, I know the planning director's back there, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but I have to think that if, if um, you know, somebody referenced the analogy to, I think Mr. Jones referenced the analogy to Sims, that if this were a parcel that were um, um, <clears throat> potential candidate for a rezoning along multi-use that potentially we'd be increasing the value to ourselves through that that process so I just want to put a few of those things out there because we've had a lot of ideas we put on the table and I don't know if they're all mutually exclusive if we're talking uh, around a, a, a time trial basis and potential disposition of an asset but also potentially increasing the value of that asset through the master planning process so as we go down this road I just wanted to put put some of those ideas out there for um, my colleagues on the subcommittee to consider as we go forward. Thank you. I, I just, I agreed with every speaker that spoke. I just don't think we can satisfy all of them. No. Hmm. And, yes, Mr. And Hahn. just briefly, because it is a public hearing and we are leaving it open, I believe, for at least another week for comments, um, I have peaks and valleys of what I've heard and what I've yet not to hear. Um, so. Don't take the fact that I really don't have any remarks either way, pro or con, mm. except for the fact that that's, there's a process in place. There's still another week that this is open. I do want to let my colleagues um, on the board, as well as the rest of the committee, receive all that information, compile it in whatever format they deem appropriate. Um, and you know, I assume there'll be a recommendation or recommendations, but um, I, if it's possible, if we could just get a very b brief synopsis or glossary of, of the 30 requests that we got if some of them are, are consistent, you know, you don't have to repeat it, but if you can say of the 30 we got, five were for co-working, um, uh, three were for veteran uh, youth programs, things like that, you know, if you could just break down, um, just so we know how the requests came in, if, if that's not a sort of insurmountable task, if, if that's okay, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Uh, I'm just really glad we've done this hearing. Uh, the, it was a, uh, very interesting for me. Uh, I'm glad that we have time to think about it more. I am. I agree completely. Um, yeah, this this was very helpful, um, and I do want to encourage you know anyone watching that has some ideas to please um, send your recommendations along what you'd like to see happen to 1207 Mass Ave. Um, I did see another one hand up in the back. Um, if you wanted to. the veterans around town and many of them are contractors and many of them are willing to you know put if we can keep it within the family here but many of them are willing to put in the effort of refurbishing the building not for free because they, they they're small businesses but at least for cost you know so you can also consider that 
in the, in the value of trying to get things together. I mean, we're, we're townies too, you know? We don't want, we don't want everything to go and you know, getting off the low, you know that? <laughs> thank, thank you very much, sir. We, we, we graduated at the same time, so what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 that's got, it's something that you got to put into consideration, too, because the costs are going to be a, a big factor in what you want to do with the building. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, right, let's, let, let's get everybody involved. All right? Thank Thanks you very much. To me again. I really appreciate the time. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Although now I'm voting against him since I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> um, any further discussion? Um, seeing none, but um, we, we will compile this and we will meet again um, to discuss uh, what will happen moving forward. And I'd just like to thank everyone for being here today. Um, so thank you. Um, moving on, we have an appointment to the Council on Aging for uh, James Munsey. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight, and um, My pleasure, Mr. I hope you found that uh, interesting as we did. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, where should I start? Um, I was born in Arlington, been a lifelong resident, and it looks like some of my history is disappearing. <laughs> I was born at Sims Hospital. <laughs> I worked for six years for Brigham's, and I think your relative, John, used to work at the Brigham's on the Heights. Yep. He worked for me. Yep. <laughs> and Diane and I have worked for a number of years on getting some parking signs put up. Thank hmm. you, Diane. Yeah. Um, I attended Arlington High. Just had my 50th reunion last week ago Saturday <laughs> at the town hall. I'm a graduate of Northeastern University, business, business administration. I've had my own business for 10 years. And when <clears throat> Staples came along, I closed that. And I moved on to Fidelity Investments for 20 years. So within Fidelity Investments, I had a lot of business experience, business analyst, and they decided to put me through computer school for six months and learn how to be a mainframe computer software engineer. And that's when I left Fidelity when my job went to New Hampshire. I'm currently working part-time at the Council on Aging as a driver and I love interacting with the seniors because I love their lack of filters. It's just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric brought up a good point a little while ago when he talked about intergenerational programs. Um, the Council on Aging has one that I'm well aware of, but there are others that I've talked with the board as a guest saying I'd like to see more intergenerational programs for high school students and others because the bridges that get made by those meetings are just astounding. Mm. Thank I've, you. I've been married <laughs> with my lovely wife, Diane, for 86 years, uh, 43 years. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like 86 to her. <laughs> well, it's time That's two. true. <laughs> times two. And we got married um, by a wonderful priest who decided to leave the priesthood. And guess which church we got married at? St. Jerome. There you go. <laughs> I, I told you my history is getting slowly devolved here. Um, I'm currently taking a Spanish course sponsored by the Council on Aging. Um, just trying to get my toes wet in that language. And the Council is offering so much to so many people. And I think we as a group in town don't get the message out to all the seniors of all the programs that are available and nor do we use the executive secretary over there, the executive director, to the talent that she brings to that office. She has so many ideas and she has so many opportunities to run new programs for our seniors. And I just want to be a part of trying to help her get that done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Kiro. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for uh, volunteering. You have an impressive background. I do have to note, though, you have so many companies and institutions you've been associated with which are no longer with us. So Tell me about if it. we confirm your appointment in five years, will the Council on Aging still be in existence? <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. You're thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Move approval. And thank you for what you've already done, Council on Aging. You've done some training for them. Oh, uh, you're aware of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, reading this, at Boston Coach, did you know Mike Fox well? 
very well. He was yeah. the chairman of the board when I was there. Yeah, I worked. Oh, yeah. I worked with him a lot. Still, he's a so. fabulous guy, yeah. I and mean, he's not afraid to shake things up. <laughs> but thank you for your willingness to serve. We're lucky to have you. Thank, thank you, you. Miss Mahan. I'm not. I know that's motion. Motion. I'll second. Um, I do want to say, having worked with you in the past, um, first of all, thank you for all your dedication, not only on the council on aging issues, but also other issues that involve, you know, neighborhood and, and yeah. quality of life, but also understanding the process that you know sometimes you, you want to rush from, from point a to b and you don't understand how you can't get there you have certainly shown restraint as well as um the ability there you go <laughs> yeah. exactly but also to you know define the process and the ability to um go along the guidelines and actually as you say persevere and, and, and hang in and i know you, you'll bring that same tenacity yes. <laughs> um to the council on aging i'm thrilled what you said about the intergenerational remarks I'm a big proponent, along with everybody else with that, um, like to find more avenues that we can do that. And I know you've worked on, I've heard a few, and I think you might reference in here, a few projects with Susan Carp. So you're going to hit the ground running on this. So um, and thank you for your kind remarks earlier, and I look forward to your appointment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. John. Your passion comes through, and I'm really excited. Thank you very much for volunteering. My pleasure, sir. Yes. Um, no, and I agree. I'm, um, I really appreciate um, your willingness to do this, and I also like that you act, partake in the programs, as that so you have a, you know that firsthand experience that I don't know all um, Council on Aging members have. Um, so yeah, thanks. This will be great, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Moving on, uh, request for a transfer of stock. Uh, some new officer and director issuance of stock. Uh, Jun Chen uh, from Sono. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. My name is Chris Coleman. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. The restaurant we're talking about is uh, Sono Asian Cuisine, located at 469 or 471 Summer Street. Four things we're looking for permission to do here tonight. Uh, there's a new stockholder that's going to be holding stock in the corporation. So it's going to be a transfer of stock issuance of new stock, as well as appointment of new officers and directors. Uh, Mr. Wu Chen here is the current manager. That will remain unchanged. Uh, he will be issued another 5,000 shares of stock in the corporation to make it a total of 10 that he'll be holding. And so Wan Wan Lin, Mr. Lin, is transferring his shares, 5,000 shares, to uh, Jun Chen. Um, it's still uh, going to be... Uh, all U.S. citizens, as far as the majority of the board of directors. Uh, the new officers, Mr. Chen currently is the uh, clerk. He will also now be the president, treasurer, clerk, and a director. And Mr. Chen will be the new director who's acquiring uh, Mr. Lin's stock. So other than that, there'll be no changes at the restaurant and no real impact other than the new owner's going to be involved. Thank no you. Criminal background, every pa thing past Corey. Thank you very much, <coughs> sir. Questions from the board, comments? Mr. Dunn. Move approval subject to conditions. Second with a procedural question is um, there's three actions in there. Is it appropriate that we vote all three at once or should we vote them separately? Um, Attorney Heim or Mrs. Sullivan. I'm, I'm just saying he's saying he wants a vote on transfer of stock, a vote of issuance of new stock, and a vote for new officer and director. Can um, we do all three together? Sure, unless there's some uh, objection to voting on all three of them together That's and fine. you want I to vote on sure. one piece okay. at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from the board? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, any discussion from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For approval, Spy Pond uh, Beer and Wine, uh, Change of Hours, Sean Galvin. Um, I could have sworn I saw him earlier. I think oh. he's out in the hall. Do you want me to go check? If, if you could. Thank you, Kara. I thought I heard his voice. If, um, perhaps we'll move on to Citizens Open Forum in um, table number eight for the time being. Okay. Um, moving on, Citizens Open Forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three-minute time limit to present a concern or request. 
please, first. Sean. Thank you very much, Sean Harrington. Oh, sorry, Charlie. Uh, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, I'm coming forward because uh, there's an election cycle coming up, and so there's been some misinformation given about local aid for Arlington. Um, not intentionally, I don't think, but an Joe, issue that Joe, I think is important. Um, it's been said that the, um, by our state rep, Sean Garbley, that in the past five years, local aid has been increased by 35% for the town of Arlington. Um, however, if you look at former finance committee meetings, uh, quotes from our uh, town manager and many others, local aid hasn't had more than a 1% increase every year in the past five years. And going back, actually a quote from Charlie Foskett, I believe at one meeting was, if you look at local aid for Arlington versus inflation, we are down 55%. Um, I believe I got the quote correct. The um, reason I bring this up is, is I think it's really important for people to realize um, from our elected officials that this isn't true, that 35% increase in local aid hasn't happened. It seems that there's uh, some creative accounting going on here in the sense of school building reimbursement rate, which has been cut by 30% from uh, by uh, the legislature, but that's a whole other ballgame, um, is being added to this uh, added to the local aid increase uh, that's being uh, uh, perpetuated uh, through town during this election cycle. Um, more or less what's been the math they're using is that if I was to make a thousand bucks in one week, spend 300 bucks on office supplies and get reimbursed at 300 bucks, I made $1,300 in that week. That's, that's just not true. Um, I think that's very important that we set the record straight and actually for uh, possibly Board of Selectmen and other boards in town, to set the record straight by saying, no, these are the numbers for local aid. If you look at local aid, we've had a 1% growth every year. Actually, if you look at the numbers uh, for 2014, once you take away what we're paying for uh, kindergarten, uh, once, once we got full day kindergarten, local aid is actually lower than it was in 2002 when it was cut during the recession, which is an interesting fact to know. I mean, if you, you can ask any board in Arlington, board of selectmen, you ask town manager, you could ask the chairman of the finance committee or any member of the finance committee, they will tell you local aid has not seen a 35% increase. It's just creative accounting, you know, not trying to say that it is done with some malicious intent. I just think it's um, using the wrong math. But I think it's important to set the record straight on what the real, what real math says about the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yes, um, next, Citizens Open Forum. Please, sir. Good evening. My name is. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Good evening. Chairman and uh, members of the board of uh, the selectmen. And uh, my name is Charlie Hayes, and I'm from Precinct 11. And I'm here to uh, uh, discuss the de decision that was made by the town to uh, reallocate uh, space at, at the Arlington Senior Center and transfer it to uh, the Council on Aging. And it's too bad, <laughs> Mr. Mussey didn't hear this, but it's just. Uh, uh, it's, in my estimation, it's an unfortunate thing. I'm speaking only as a senior from Arlington and a taxpayer from Arlington. I'm not speaking for the Arlington Senior Center or the Arlington Seniors Association. <clears throat> uh, in my opinion, the decision uh, made in transferring these, uh, these spaces is... is <clears throat> Let me see here. Uh, is really most unfortable. It's just uh, uh, the advocate, advocate uh, uh, printed a, an article in the paper approximately two weeks ago, and it was, you know, if you read it, it was is on the first page. It just, uh, it stated that uh, uh, Council on Aging will control space. And when, when one reads that, it's just very misleading. You wouldn't say, well, so what? That's not much of an issue. But if you read the entire article, it is pretty moving. It impacts the senior center very, very much in its operation. <clears throat> uh, the Council on Aging uh, went to the town to request additional space because they, to satisfy their needs. And it was, <clears throat> and it was presented to the uh, town, was it developmental? 
ARB. What is it? The Redevelopment Board. Oh, Redevelopment Program, okay. And uh, a department. And it was determined that uh, space was available at the uh, senior center that could satisfy this need. Well, <clears throat> that decision may be very good from the town's vantage point, but uh, from the senior center advantage, uh, vantage point, it certainly isn't. They've been working in a space that's been provided by the town uh, for over 30 years, and <clears throat> they have uh, done extremely well. It's run by 12 to 15 volunteers that supplement one full-time employee and one part-time employee to carry out their numerous tasks. And I personally believe that they have <coughs> provided a, uh, a significant contribution to the seniors of Arlington. It's not the greatest place in the world, but and they don't have, don't have much parking area at all. That's one of the biggest deficiencies uh, in me, the facility. Excuse uh, me, facility. Mr. Hayes. Um, we, are, we are reaching the three, three minutes, minutes okay. so uh, if you could just make some closing remarks, okay. that would be great. Okay. Uh, it's just that uh, my, uh, my uh, consensus is that, uh, that the, the decision was made by the town was, was too uh, abrupt and was not done to see the, co the impact that it would, it would uh, affect both parties, especially the senior center. So with that, I would, would request a reconsideration of the decision by the redevelopment board in the re reallocation of spaces from the senior center to the, uh, to the Council on Aging. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for Thank being you. here tonight, Mr. Hayes. Mr. Foskett. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, <clears throat> first of all, let me say that um, I have deep respect for the Board of Selectmen and the tremendous amount of work that you put in every year, year after year, and um, deeply appreciate it. However, I appear before you tonight on the subject of the CPA uh, Tax Act as a little bit of a scold, perhaps a modern-day Savonarola, trying to get you back to the straight and narrow. And I'm here to ask you to uh, deeply consider changing your vote to support um, the vote no on ballot question number five. I have three reasons for that. Last Tuesday at the Long Range Planning Committee meeting, which was chaired by uh, Mr. Curro, uh, the town manager presented a new five-year plan in which our projected deficit in fiscal year 2020 was 14.2 million, up a million point four since the April plan uh, presented to town meeting by the town manager and the finance committee. So our position deteriorated by $1.4 million in six months, for good reasons. And I'm not here to discuss those reasons. But the conclusion, if I can sort of broadly suggest it for, by, or summarize it by the Long Range Planning Committee and its chair, was to ask the town manager to develop some new plans, which included uh, rethinking a lot of things, and to try to get the deficit, the, the, the structural deficit down to a range that could support an override. So uh, I believe that's in, uh, inevitably going to involve expense reductions and service cuts. And it's unconscionable to me that members of this board are supporting the CPA tax increase override when we are looking at cutting expenses and reducing service over the next five years, four years, in order to be able to affect the override that we all know we're going to need. Secondly, um, the, there's been a lot of discussion about the so-called um, implied debt limit that we discussed in the capital budget at, at uh, town meeting. And I have to say that that was based on an estimate of $120 million school expense. And that school budget, that school project is now getting in the $150 to $200 million range. So, so that, first of all, takes a chunk out of that implied, um, implied uh, debt, debt capacity. But the CPA tax itself is going to suck up 60% of that implied debt capacity. So if the CPA tax passes, the entire school project is going to be sitting out there in its naked glory as a full tax increase to the citizens of the town. And that's just not acceptable. And I think uh, my third comment would be that um, there's a tremendous reliance on the so-called um, uh, state uh, 
matching funds. In 2002, the state matching funds, the collections from the registry deeds was 34, 35 million dollars. There were 34 towns in the, in the CPA, and now there's 155. Excuse me, Mr. Foskett, if uh, we are reaching three minutes, if you can make you. a closing I'll statement. Be, so so we, we've, we've gone down to $140,000 uh, collected per town, and in, in summary, the CPA tax is just, for all of those reasons, a very bad deal for Arlington, and I hope that the Board of Selectmen reconsiders their individual positions and recommends that the citizens vote against um, ballot question number five. Thank you. I do like the first question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Um, is anyone else here for Citizens Open Forum? Seeing none, uh, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. That was some good discussions on a few different topics. Um, so I assume that we could not find Mr. Galvin. No. Um, so perhaps we'll table that until the next meeting and uh, okay. hope that he can join us. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, is it necessary? Does he have to be here? Um, I'm just. I mean, it's just a change of hour. I, I don't. Yeah, I. We, I mean, I'm. I, I. I would move. We. Uh, we support it, but. Okay. We have done restaurant change yeah. of hours under Without. consent agenda in the past. This is a new venue for a change of hours, so it's you know package store. Mr. Carroll. Yeah, thank you. I have no pro I have no problem supporting it. Also, without him here, I, I just I was a little bit confused by the advisory from the state. Though, on the one hand, it seemed to to say that local licensing boards didn't even have to approve these. That that the um, the stores only had to notify us. But on the other hand, it then it then advised them to apply for a change of hours. So I, it wasn't I was even clear to me whether whether we needed a vote or not. I think it's probably better to err on the side of caution, in the sense that. If you take the vote and it has no effect, I don't think it really causes a problem. But if the advisory, confusing as it is, ends up requiring the vote because they say they have to apply for it, you might as well. Well, if you made a motion, Mr. Grilly, I'll second it. I did make a motion. Yeah. I'll second it. I moved approval, yeah. Okay. I'm also fine with it as long as everyone else is. Okay. We have a, you made a motion, Mr. Grilly? Yes, sir. And Ms. Mahan second. We have a motion to second. Is anyone here to talk about this? Nope, seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Oh, congratulations to Spy Pond Beer and Wine. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Ms. Sullivan just wanted me to remind everyone that she does need signatures on that. Oh. That does require, so it would require a vote for the ABCC, too. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so we're all set then. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, um, <coughs> our planning director, Carol Kowalski, to talk about the commercial vacancy trend report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Um, I am Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, Ted Fields is our Economic Development Planner, and Ted is actually going to give you the vacancy report. He'll talk about that, and then I'll discuss some uh, broader perspective on economic development to give you some context. So, Ted, please. Hello, I'm Ted Fields, Economic Development Planner. So, thank you for inviting me to uh, address you tonight. Uh, about six months ago in the spring, the uh, board asked the planning department to provide information on commercial uh, property trends, uh, specifically in the areas of vacancy rates and turnovers, average turnovers for various types of properties. The planning department went out uh, and procured a uh, data system called the CoStar Multiple Listing Service System. It's a subscription. Uh, and we are going to summarize some of the key findings for you tonight. Uh, I've provided you with a memorandum and a chart that goes into greater depth of detail. In the interest of brevity, I will address the vacancy and the turnover uh, matters, and then uh, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, vacancy rates are, by definition, uh, the amount of available vacant commercial space divided by the existable rent, uh, rentable space. Um, and right now, Arlington's overall vacancy rate uh, is very uh, low at 1.5% uh, compared to some of our neighbors. Uh, Lexington, for example, is at 9.9%. Cambridge is at 6.2%. And Belmont is at 2.8%. Um, 
and uh, that's for all different types of commercial properties, shops, offices, and industrial factories and warehouses and whatnot. Uh, today, our vacancy rate for all commercial properties is lower than pre-2007 levels. Uh, it's dropped quite a bit. And, um, and as a response, our um, rents, average rents have gone up, uh, especially for uh, retail spaces. Uh, with turnovers, or average tur turnover, I should say, uh, the definition of turnover is uh, time on market uh, for vacant spaces uh, from when they're uh, become vacant to when they're reused, uh, released. Uh, Arlington's turnover rate right now for all different types of property is about 17 months, and that's on par with uh, the levels in Lexington, Belmont, and Winchester, uh, but it's considerably longer than uh, Cambridge and Somerville and Medford, too. Um, so with that said, I will uh, be happy to address your questions. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this. I was definitely one of the people who was asking for this, and I'm really happy to see it, having seen it. I now, of course, have, do have questions. Sure. Tell, uh, so I was pretty stunned to see the vacancy rate as low as it was. Right. And so the first thing, of course, you do is you say, you know, do we tr like how good is the data source? How much do you trust right. these numbers? And so my first question is, is how much have you vetted it? How much do you trust it? Where do you think it's right? Where do you think it's wrong? Uh, well, it to our uh, knowledge, given the research that we did, uh, it, it CoStar uh, is the most accurate uh, data service within our budget range, which, which is under $5,000 per year. Uh, it is the only service that we could find in that price range that actually has a research staff that vets each listing and updates each listing on a monthly basis. Uh, competitors such as LoopNet uh, do not do that. It's just more of a bulletin board for uh, property owners and brokers to post listings, but they don't check them for accuracy uh, for uh, whether they're live or dead or whatnot. So uh, to our mind, uh, the CoStar subscription was the most cost-effective way of getting a regular monitored, relatively accurate stream of information uh, on a continual basis. Um, that said, uh, I have looked at uh, their listing information and what they list as vacant and what's uh, not available. And not every property owner uh, utilizes a broker mm -hmm. who advertises, advertises space on CoStar. Uh, many of the smaller property owners, especially of small storefronts, will do their marketing themselves. So for that reason, I have gone out and I've supplemented um, the uh, listings um, that aren't on CoStar, that are uh, visible within town, either for, for rent signs or, or are advertised through other medium uh, with the CoStar data. And I indicate that on the, on the chart there. Um, so actually, then help me a little bit more with that. Sure. Then, so you've got, you've got, I've got, uh, I've got the gra the line graph, and then I've got, and I actually printed out even the, the this chart. Okay, there. yes, the the tables with yeah. Arlington. Basically, CoStar right now, the, in the CoStar system, it's advertising a 1.5 percent rate. Right. Uh, adding in the properties that aren't on CoStar, that comes up to about three percent. So T even so, tell me where is that here anywhere or no? Uh, it's, it's in the table. It's in that, that heavy box near the end. Oh, the to so the total vacancy rate. Oh, now I understand what you did there. Okay, yes. okay. Um, so even with the properties that aren't on CoStar, the overall vacancy rate is still quite low in town uh, right now. As I say in my memo, vacancies in town tend to be very visible because they're right on Mass Ave or to a lesser extent on Broadway. They're very visible. Many of them are very clumped in clusters in the center and the heights. Uh, somebody was mentioning before the, the cluster of vacancies around the 1207 Mass Ave property. Um, but there's uh, quite a bit of commercial space in town that's not as readily visible, that is uh, tenanted. Uh, so it's important to put the vacancy numbers in that perspective. That's pretty good. I, re I, I like the the, taking this taking this source and add, uh, adding your own information sure. that's um, I really like that methodology okay okay thank you thank you Ms. Wan. Um I guess I'd just sort of piggyback and I think I already heard the answer um, I was thinking of you know what properties get reported what about the rep properties and 
most of them are highly visible ones where the yeah. owners are choosing to say, I'm just going to wait it out right. and leave it vacant right. for so on. But I guess the crux of my question would be, um, most respectfully, what is the what should what are we being asked to do with this information? Is this, I mean, this is great information to have, but why do we have it? Um, what do you suggest this will I I enable us to do, aid us to do? I'm not. Well, I, th I think first and foremost, me the members next? of the board requested this information at oh, a meeting okay. in the spring. Oh, okay. Oh, then I apologize. I must have missed that meeting. But is there something beyond um, answering a question that we should be doing with this data, or is this just a you you wanted to know the information? Here's the answer. Is that what it is? Well, I think it also does. It speaks to the health of the economy. It speaks to the efforts of the economic development, uh, or Ted being the economic development staff and planning. And I think Carol's going to get into some of the broader That's pictures. And I missed two what, meetings, what so I, I apologize. I wasn't there for the beginning, so that's why perhaps I'm not getting it. Thank I'll, you. I'll uh, hand you over to Thank Carol. Thank you. Sorry. Actually, um, well, I, I will, if I, we have some more questions coming okay, sure. your way, I think, Ted. Um, did you have a I actually wanted to, uh, my, to give my answer to Mrs. Mahan if that's uh, appropriate, but what I do with this data. Mm -hmm. So for me, when we're talking about policies, where we're talking about whether it's parking on Mass Ave, whether it's talking about zoning changes that we like, you know, weigh in or on or anything like that, for me, I like the more I can know about what the actual situation is as opposed to the, like, we, like I, I know which stores I notice are vacant and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean what's the big picture. And so for me, this helps me decide um, votes that we take that are policy driven about economic activity. And so that's why I'd ask for it. So I, I, I just, I hope that helps answer your question. Thank you. Mr. Kira. Well, I, I would just piggyback on Dan. I think actually great, we had a great example earlier tonight. I mean, I think as we're discussing potential uses for that property on Mass Ave and potential conversion to commercial, it's, it's, it's very helpful to understand what this market is uh, looking like for myself and what potential impact is of the decisions we make there. That, that's one thing I would. Thank you. So. Mr. Greeley. Yeah, I was going to ask, is that space considered uh, part of this vacancy? The 1207? Yes. Uh, right now, it is not. CoStar is listing it as not on the market. I can certainly add it to it and tweak the numbers to some degree. Mm -hmm. and, and Ted, is there such a thing as a waiting list? Do we know that our, our that a lot of other businesses would love to open in Arlington? Uh, and sp having spoken with a number of property owners, uh, a number of them have, are talking with a, many different possible tenants for vacant properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Um, it seems, and do you have a theory on why our industrial flex space is up, has a total vacancy rate of 11.7%? While you know everything else is down between you know one and three essentially, well, the, a number of those properties are older, mm -hmm. and uh, many of the uses in them uh, are no longer very profitable and have either ceased business uh, or are running along at a fairly low rate. And uh, in some of those spaces, uh, the remaining businesses have only take up a part of the space. Um, so I think. Uh, those properties um, just uh, did they have large blocks of space uh, and in, in many cases they're used for short-term uh, storage uh, uses like warehousing uh, and whatnot that tend to uh, be a little bit more volatile they're used maybe for part of the year not part of the year mm -hmm. uh, if you notice uh, the, the flex space tends to have a very short duration of um, turnover about four and a half months mm -hmm. uh, so that it is rather flexible space. It's used um, as needed and then kind of goes offline. Um, so right now there's a, a number of, of properties that just aren't being used um, and aren't being marketed very heavily, but they are out there and they are garnering some interest. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is another phenomenon that I think you, <clears throat> you hint at here in the, in the report. You actually you, you, you reference it in the report. Um, I think a lot of times when we see vacant um, <clears throat> retail space in particular, we a lot of times will assume that, well, they can't find any tenants for that space. Correct. But clearly that's not always the case, that sometimes it is a situation where the landlord is just is being much more selective in yes. the tenants that they bring in. And I didn't know if you could shed a little bit more light sure. on, on what the landscape is in Arlington. Um, Having talked to a number of brokers in town, they report that uh, 
give, uh, as vacancy rates have gone down and has the rental, especially for retail space, the rentals have gone up, uh, property owners are more able, if they want to, to uh, wait and look for the perfect tenant uh, instead of renting to any, the first person who comes in. Many property owners, uh, especially those without large levels of debt on the property, are waiting for uh, very high quality tenants uh, who have the right types of businesses to um, uh, accentuate uh, their other ten the businesses of their other tenants uh, and that have the, the greatest possibility of renting for five, ten years at the rates um, that are advertised. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're, these property owners will need to wait mm -hmm. to get the right tenant. Thank you very much. Um, any further questions from the board? Just one quick comment, and I want to apologize if my question was taken anyway, but um, maybe um, because where I said I did miss two meetings, so ap apologies to my colleagues. Just maybe in the future, if, if possible, more times than not, when we get backup material, there's some sort of cover letter, even if it has two or three sentences um, that comes from whomever, sure. whether it's a department head, yeah. the town manager, or Mr. Fields that would say, you know, in response to the board's query, please see the enclosed backup plan. Most of the um, documents that we have, there's usually some, and it doesn't have to be a cover letter, and it doesn't have to be, you know, maybe one or two sentences, so maybe for board members like me that missed the meeting and, you know, weren't there for step one, it, it might aid me in the future to not ask that question and maybe have it be misconstrued. So thank you. Thank you. Is uh, anyone in the audience here that wants to say a few words on this agenda item? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ted. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Moving on, uh, Ms. Kowalski. So I, I wanted to give a little um, context for Ted's presentation, a uh, little, little broader perspective on why we do economic development, which I think is what um, Ms. Mahan is trying to get at. When we engage in economic development, we're trying to, to do a few things. We're trying to um, create tax base. We're trying to increase property values uh, to retrain, retain, and attract wealth. We're trying to bring spending from outside of Arlington into Arlington and keep that investment here. We're trying to reduce poverty. That's why communities, it's one reason why communities do economic development. Uh, creating jobs, retaining jobs. We do it for economic stability so that we can weather economic cycles better and for economic self-sufficiency so we're not d dependent on as dependent on the state, for example. There's an important interplay and balance among those elements. Uh, we also can measure those elements. That's really important. Uh, otherwise, we really don't know how we're doing. When we think of economic development in Arlington, I think we kind of reflexively think of the stores and the restaurants. Uh, but I want to give you two examples of how these elements play out in Arlington. Um, we have two businesses in two of our commercial districts that attract from the outside $2.4 million in spending to the other businesses in those districts. But altogether, those two businesses have less than eight full-time employees. So they don't create a lot of jobs, but they attract a lot of wealth, comparatively speaking. Then on the other hand, on our top 10 employer list, half are tax-exempt or governmental organizations. So they create jobs, but they're not contributing to the tax base. So I'm giving you those two examples to see how you might get, uh, you know, on this list of economic development elements, you want to balance. You don't want to have only job creation. You, you don't want to have only uh, uh, attracting wealth from outside. So I also think it's important for us, us to Remember that uh, we have a lot more businesses than we have landowners. But the landowners are really in the power seat. I think you all realize that. But it's hard for us to bear that in mind because they're less visible. But we always want to ask ourselves, what are our policies and practices, what message are they sending to property owners and business owners? Some of the policies you've undertaken recently have been beneficial and have had a direct impact on the, prop, the landlords and the businesses. You allowed beer and wine licenses. That was this board's action. And think of how fundamental, 
how fundamentally that changed Arlington's economic development. You took on a change in parking policy to create more parking availability. That's really powerful. The board's support in investment for public infrastructure investment is, is very important because when the municipality invests in infrastructure, the private sector invests in their own properties. They see it, a, a, it's a vote of confidence. They say, I know this is a good bet here. Our permitting processes and even pre-permitting certain sites for the types of businesses we want is very, it can also attract the, the types of businesses that we, we, we see as part of our culture that, that will create the type of jobs we want and the, attract the kind of wealth we know we could take advantage of with the, the training that and the high education level of Arlington, which we kind of take for granted. But it is, it, it's a demonstrated asset that's been identified by the economic development self-assessment tool that was done for us a few years ago. Um, I want to um, comment briefly on a little bit of history. Uh, when technology was emerging as an economic development force in this region, MITRE Corporation, does anyone remember MITRE Corporation? MITRE Corporation had one of its first offices in Arlington <coughs> at the old Ring Sanatorium. Uh, this was in 1958. But they were forced out because it was a residential district, and it was, uh, there was some sus suspicion about what they were doing. There wasn't a, a lot of understanding, but it was also a residential district, so they went out. Also, um, in 1968, Wang Labs really didn't have much of a reputation in computers until they bought the biggest data processing company in Massachusetts at the time, Philip Hawkins of Arlington, Massachusetts. Our geography and our populace signal to us we're, in, we're located in an area and we have a population that we can take advantage of for economic development. We, getting back to our, um, our real estate, we have very little land that's zoned. We decided a long time ago we were going to be predominantly a bedroom community. And I, I know you've all seen this. This is just our zoning map. But look how much of it is dark yellow or light yellow or green. That's residential or parks or schoolyards. The colored strip in the middle, it's a fraction of our land area, but that's what we've got to work with for economic development. So we have excess, we have some capacity under our zoning, but it's very challenging. So I. I think one of the recommendations that will come out of the master plan will be to consider upzoning some of our commercial districts to allow us to meet that demand and to boost our economic development. So to wrap up, I, I think it's important to remember you, we need to measure, we need to compare ourselves against similar communities, which is uh, what this co-star, that's an example of the type of economic metrics we should be using. We need to compare over time to observe trends, and we need data from a variety of sources. So I, I want to ask you to always think about what type of economic development benefit are we getting from our actions? How would we measure it? Is it measurable? And to try to instill that throughout the whole organization, because Every contact we have with a property owner or a business is critical. It, it sends a message of, are we expecting you? Are we welcoming you? So I applaud you for the policies that you've taken that have been so good for business over the recent years. And as we're concluding the master plan, I, I hope that you'll continue to have that perspective when you consider future policy making, including supporting possible zoning changes that might come as a recommendation of the master plan. Uh, you received an invitation to the uh, November 6th presentation from the master plan consultant next uh, Thursday, and I, I hope you'll consider attending. That'll be a joint meeting with the master plan advisory committee and the redevelopment board who uh, will be expected to uh, hold the public hearing and a possible vote to make it our policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Um, do we have questions from the board? 
Mr. Kira. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. You, you know, I appreciate the work that you all do. Um, I do notice in the material you gave us that the, the very first resource that you direct us towards um, are some case studies on uh, business improvement districts. Is this something that's been actively discussed with some of the, um, the, uh, the merchants and businesses in town? I noticed that it, that it does have to be initiated by, by them, but, but presumably with some direction. No, I don't think we're quite ready. I, I, I think we're building up. I think the merchants are building up to possibly persuading their own landlords to adopt a business, a business improvement district. The landlords, it's not the business owners, it's the landlords that have to adopt a bid. Uh, and that's challenging. Right. So that, that also underscores why it's so important to have good relations, good relationships with our landlords. Um, I want to show the board a couple of things that are available so you can see some of the work that um, Ted has done. I know the board's been interested in storefront enhancement. Um, there is a storefront enhancement program. Uh, Ted put this uh, brochure together and there are a few copies here if you're interested in taking a closer look. Um, there's also a new business guide on our website and um, it's also uh, hard copies are available for prospective businesses coming to Arlington. Great, thank you. Thank you also, um, I did want to just note that you know, I, I've appreciated um, that you've organized these seminars on, on working spaces and co-working arrangements and I did want to note that you know, a number of the people who actually testified earlier this evening had actually gone to those seminars and I think that's why you were hearing that as a theme through some of the testimony this evening was as a direct result of some of the work that, that our planning department has done around this to, to bring in some of the, the leaders in the field. So, so thank you on that. Further questions from the board? Mr. Greeley. Nothing. I just really appreciate the work Ted and Carol um, are doing for us. Uh, I, I always bore you with stories of when I was a lad. <laughs> but when I was first on the board, the vacancy rate was 26%. And we actually, as a group, went up to Lexington Center to try and figure out why they were thriving and we weren't. Uh, and it's just thrilling, Terry. It's one point whatever percent, seven, Ted, was it? 1.5. 1. 1. 1.5 percent now. And as I've also told you all before, a few years back, the Lexington Board of Selectmen came to Arlington <laughs> to study why we were so thriving and they had such a higher vacancy rate. But, uh, I think it's a very good sign for us. Uh, it, it, it's, there's not much room for growth, but you know, may it continue to be that lower vacancy rate. And I think you're right. There's no question. Restaurants, alcohol have made a huge difference in terms of. Uh, that's the biggest difference over my 26 years. So, uh, is that you taking credit for this low percentage now, Kevin? Well, if we let them. <laughs> there's not many liquor things that have been done in this town without my vote. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know. I, I would like to note that the uh, Economic Development Director of Lexington is an Arlington resident and recently joined our uh, Master Plan Advisory Committee, so I think they're still trying to learn from us. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. very Thank much you very for being much. with us I appreciate tonight. the opportunity. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Was anyone in the audience here to speak on this? Ted. Seeing none. Could I have a copy of that? Yeah. So, moving on. Uh, discussion on Mount Pleasant Cemetery parking and cut through traffic. Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, as you may recall, uh, town meeting, there were several warrant articles dealing with issues at the cemetery. Uh, so the chairman and I have had uh, several discussions over the past couple months about bringing this back to the board for discussion and follow-up. Uh, and there's, there's really two separate areas that I addressed in a memo I provided to the board. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll start with the second, er, uh, second issue being cut through traffic. Uh, that's an issue that uh, folks at town meeting raised as a concern and something that the DPW director and I certainly saw as a concern. Uh, and I believe at that time we committed to performing some kind of traffic count or traffic study to try to get a handle on exactly where the people came from, where they exited, so where we could best consider the installation of, uh, of an impediment, I will say, to reducing that cut through traffic. So the DPW director um, has got a proposal to perform that study. This would be a very accurate study. It would actually involve counting in the morning rush hour and then the afternoon rush hour, afternoon starting from school rush all the way in to the end of workday rush. Uh, 
So I think it's called a source destination study as we identify where we're going to count where people come in, where they leave, and how long they're in the cemetery so we can determine exactly, again, the best way to um, limit cut through. So there's, that study is going to go forward. I wanted to be able to tell the board that publicly, uh, say that that's going to happen and, and happen very soon before the winter begins uh, so that we can make a follow-up recommendation. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you say it will start when? Uh, I don't have a date, but it will start very soon, okay. in the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Don't drive through that day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that wasn't directed at you. <laughs> um, uh, the second issue uh, addressed first in the memo was the issue of parking on CHM Ave in the cemetery. Uh, and I think, as we all recall, uh, that really had a very long discussion at town meeting. Uh, and I've sat with the DPW director as well as the police chief uh, to talk about, uh, you know, what was causing parking there, uh, issues to address, and what can be done. Um, those discussions left us very comfortable that uh, either stricter enforcement of the current regulations of no parking for other than cemetery business could be manageable or something else could be manageable. Uh, so I wanted to prompt a dialogue with the board tonight to suggest some guidance for, uh, for me, for the cemetery commission, um, really based on what we heard at town meeting. Uh, I, I think there was sort of a, a diversity of opinion of, uh, you know, perhaps putting time-limited parking for people who want to walk in the cemetery uh, or uh, do some other sort of path, passive recreation bird watching in the cemetery, um, which might not be interpreted as strictly cemetery business. So um, from the town's point of view, with construction starting to subside uh, for, from the National Grid Project, uh, understanding we do have construction for the third phase of the community safety building coming up next year, but uh, with a focus on that of trying to make sure those contractors park off-site uh, being something we want to do, uh, we're comfortable we can um, generally not have to use that space uh, for any kind of town overflow parking, but enough for me. I didn't want to prompt a discussion of the board for appropriate solutions as the board sees, uh, sees fit. Thank you, um, Mr. Chaplain. I'm I'm glad that I was really happy that Adam uh, wanted to put this on the agenda. Um, it's very fitting and I think we can all agree that if we went back to town meeting without addressing this, we'd all be in uh, big, big trouble. Um, so that being said, I, I just would like to open up for the board for a preliminary discussion and then um, of course I'll get the audience involved. Yes, Ms. Mahan. And I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, Regarding um, the first item you addressed, the parking, um, I fully support um, that process in terms of signage. I, I, I wouldn't propose particular signage anywhere because um, I think the um, various groups that you've referenced you will work with um, will come up with that and then you can present that to the board whether it's just a move receipt and it's, it's an action you do on your own or whether you need a vote of the board. On the cut through traffic, <clears throat> I'm just trying to go by the memory of town meeting and things um, that you know that were noted a, a, a few times and I think someone on behalf of the town responded that we would look into this um, or study it there were two or three town meeting members who came up and asked why we weren't putting closing off at particular times particular access points whether it be um, on Medford Street whether it be halfway on each side of the bridge, whether it be Satcham Ave, A, w whether we do that and where we do it, and B, when would the chains go up? Or, or, or would it be a combination thereof that maybe there's permanent chains on, on each side of, or, you know, yeah. structures, and that um, Satcham Ave and Pleasant Street, the chains won't go up until 9 p.m. So uh, am I to assume that's also inherent in terms of what you're going to look at for the study for the cut through traffic? That, that's exactly what we want to get out of the study. Okay, so yeah. since I t don't see it there, there, there are other things. And then the only other thing that um, I think is the second or third piece that you and the chairman um, will also be getting things together and presenting to us was, um, and I know you gave a brief report to town meeting regarding any sort of road improvements, road infrastructure improvements, you know, curbings, things like that. I think you said that there was a plan to do that, but I think, and you can speak better to this, that we, as part of committing to a plan that we did, we still need to go to next year's town meeting to, I mean, correct me, what's my memory? No, that, that's right, so water system improvements are undergo, underway right now. There's money in the current capital plan to begin roadway improvements. 
but to really uh, do the full, uh, full roadway improvement up to the level of where we wanted to get after last year's town meeting discussion, there's a further capital request for the FY16 capital budget as well. So my question would be, if I'm taking those as three different action steps, and we, we have the funding for one and two in town meet, meeting approval, can we begin that process, or do we have to wait until we go to next year's town meeting and get the funding for the third piece? Like, do you need all the funding set in place, or can, when we go back to town meeting next year, we can say it's three things, you've already um, appropriated funding for one and two and we've started it, but now we need three, or we say you've appropriated funding for one and two, but we need you to appropriate the funding for three so we can start all three. So I, th I think by the time we're actually done with the water improvements, we'll be into next spring anyways. Okay. And then I, b I believe DPW would prefer to issue one big roadway improvements contract. So we'll be ready to roll early in next fiscal year, you know, if and when we get that next appropriation. So we'll see a little bit of activity early spring, and then once we get to town meeting, and so I just want to show that we put in an action plan and moving forward. Yeah, we, we'll we basically definitely are say forward. once you do this, then we can hit the ground running. You know, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. <clears throat> uh, just my thoughts on the parking for the discussion. Or the manager is uh, definitely our, some of the signage is conflicting, and I think making uh, making it unified and making it improving its clarity is, uh, I think, a good thing. I think, in, uh, because I, and I think we should use that signage. We should also, not just the signage, but think about expectation setting, like what is appropriate uh, in, the, in the space. And uh, I definitely believe that, it sh that using it as an open space for the, in respectful ways is appropriate and something that I definitely want us to support where we can. And so, uh, no, that does not mean a lacrosse field, or, but yes, it does mean bird watching. Yeah. And uh, somewhere I think we can find a, a happy place where those things can happen. Um, similarly, for parking, uh, there are places in the cemeteries where it's appropriate to park, and there are some places where it isn't appropriate to park. And I think that we should be able to make a policy or a signage set or something that um, can help guide what those are. And you know, I, I, I don't have a, you know, a firm set in mind, but I mean, I do think about like the very beginning there in Satcham Ave, where you're right up against a building. There's no grave there. You, you know, pass, you can pass by. If you're parking there to me, seems like it probably should be legal. But then, you know, parking you know, on a grave, obviously, or you know, in a way that's blocking access to graves wouldn't be. So that's my, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Greeley? Just a couple of quick questions, and if you said this, forgive me, Adam. Uh, the bridge is included in what's currently under study? Yeah, so what they'll be able to tell is where someone came in and where they went out. So if they count someone as coming in off Medford Street and leaving on Sachem Ave, they'll know they went over the bridge. Okay. So, you know, once we look at those numbers, we'll be able to tell if whether, you know, a bridge obstacle or a closure at Medford or Sachem is the appropriate action. And uh, anything related to studying the chapel and the re rehab of that chapel down there? Is that, that's not related to any of this, is it? You, you know, there is a capital request, but I, I'd have to refresh myself before I could speak uh, in depth on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any further discussion from the board? Um, so I have a couple thoughts. Um, one, um, I think, this might be a good follow-up to Mr. Dunn's comments, was I, um, I really, at town meeting, there were some ideas about time-limited parking. And I, I really like that idea um, in there, and I think that's a good way to manage um, using, you know, the cemetery in respectful um, ways, um, you know, with open space like bird watching, as well as, um, you know, making sure people aren't going there and spending all day long um, and, you know, leaving cars for an extended amount of time, which there was a, quite a bit of frustration on at town meeting. Um, so I'd like that to, um, you know, be considered um, as this moves forward. Uh, I just think that it could solve quite a few problems um, pretty easily. And um, I'm happy to hear that this study is going to be done quickly because with tonight, with the opening of the warrant, I think it's only appropriate yeah. that um, you know, the town can see the results of that study and uh, we can take some action prior to the warrant, you know, uh, m maybe not opening, but definitely closing. So yep. give some, you know, um, residents the time to react to whatever we want to do yep. and keep that in mind. 
that being said, I'm, um, I'm pretty happy with the direction this is going for right now. And um, yes, Mr. Greer. Well, I just, but uh, while we're getting a report on this tonight, the manager has been working on this for a while. It's not like we're just starting. Uh, oh, I, I didn't mean No, like no, I, just, I just want to uh, clarify to uh, <coughs> the millions watching hmm. at home um, uh, in terms of uh, it is something that uh, we, we took very seriously uh, and, and have been looking into it. You know, something like time limits, though, we have to think about the enforcement and the size of that property uh, to have enforcement of time limits would be uh, very difficult. For example, when uh, Mr. Harrington came before us to complain about uh, the area at his brother's grave, we put up uh, curbing immediately and stopped that, uh, any further deterioration into that part of it on Sachem Ave. Mm -hmm. uh, and we put up a sign that said, no uh, ce uh, cemetery business parking only. But as we know from his report at town meeting and all of the many pictures, still people park there, you mm -hmm. know, even though it wasn't for a cemetery business. Now with the problem of the construction, which continues <laughs> along mm -hmm. in front of community safety and in that area as well. But uh, so it, I mean, we just, we have to also consider enforcement as well as whatever rules we do place on parking once it's down there. Of course. Thank you. Now I would uh, like to open it up to the audience. Yes, Mr. Harrington. Hello again, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. I wasn't planning on speaking on this one. I um, actually didn't even see what's on the uh, agenda. Oh, what and a pleasant surprise. Yep. Um, actually, it's kind of ironic. I don't know if that would be the right word. I just came from a uh, wake, as Steve did earlier, for a friend of mine that passed away who will be uh, interned at Mount Pleasant, I believe. I'm starting to get to know man way too many people in Mount Pleasant anyways. Um, Sorry. <clears throat> uh, the thing I was going to just remind people was that uh, during town meeting I had put up an amendment uh, about the parking situation. A lot of people were concerned that it was too strict, that um, the original uh, proposal was too strict on, you know, well, you can't just say, you know, we have to look at bird watchers. There is a, um, some conservation land in the cemetery where people can walk through. And I remember putting up a proposal. I can't remember the exact words off the top of my head, um, but more or less trying to make sure that it was more open, that people in the cemetery, like we said, you know, cemetery use, as long as you're in the cemetery and you're not parking your car and going off you know, to Dunkin' Donuts or whatever, you know, you're fine. And that passed by huge color. So I'm glad to see that that's a real big part of the discussion because I think as we all agree, there are so many good uses for that cemetery. And it's just a question of making sure that, you know, people are respected. I'm really glad to see the boards moving on this and a reference that not many people are going to get, but they should Google it and know it. Uh, I'm a political junkie. So um, good to see that something called the kingdom uh, model is working in effect where uh, public outcry was made and a legislative process is being made to render uh, the outcry. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, any further discussion from the audience? Any further discussion from the board? Well, um, Mr. So I just want to thank the board for their feedback and I will report back with more action. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on, we have a request. Um, for Wellington Street uh, referral to TAC. Uh, back to Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so provided to the board tonight was a request from uh, a resident, Mr. John Byrne, a uh, resident of Wellington Street, in regards to concerns he had about uh, the speed of traffic, uh, of cut-through traffic on Wellington Street. Uh, so uh, Mr. Uh, Byrne first came in uh, to speak with me. I think Mr. Byrne's here. Um, to speak with me in the office uh, to address the issue, sent me this follow-up email that you'd provided um, uh, to which I had asked the police department to send a response, uh, which they did, uh, and we provided that to Mr. Byrne. Uh, the uh, police department has scheduled traffic patrols. Uh, I know I, I still owe Mr. Byrne the details of when those will be uh, dispatched uh, from the police department, but uh, ultimately, uh, I'll let him speak uh, to the issue himself, but M Mr. Byrne wasn't uh, satisfied with the police department's response uh, to the matter and was uh, requesting that it be referred to TAC which would obviously be an action of the Board of Selectmen. Um, Mr. Byrne requested that we uh, put the question before the Board for a uh, potential referral, and that's why we have it on the agenda here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Mr. Byrne, you have an excellent last name. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board. Um, as Adam had relayed, I just uh, wanted to ask if we could elevate this uh, to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, I feel that the speeds that people are traveling on Wellington Street are uh, in excess of the speed limit. Um, I know that the speed limit does not get posted um, because there's a general understanding that side streets such as Wellington have a speed limit of 30 miles per hour. Um, I feel that aside from there being a significant volume of traffic there because a lot of people use it as a cut through street between Pleasant and Mass Ave, that people feel like they really need to accelerate on the hill. Um, and as a result of that, people are traveling at speeds that are in excess of the speed limit on a consistent basis. Um, a story that I had relayed to Adam was that I had my 11-year-old niece visiting me uh, three or four weeks ago. She wanted to go out and ride her bike. Um, she th was enamored of the hill and she wanted to ride down the hill and she wanted to ride up the hill. And I just didn't feel that it was safe for her. So I said, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, let's just walk down to the field and you can ride your bike around the field. So uh, I just wanted to come here tonight to respectfully request that um, the issue be elevated. I understand that the police have made an effort and I appreciate that, but the police can't be there at all times. So uh, I am asking for, um, at minimum, a reduction in the speed limit with a posting there. So if it's perhaps 20 miles an hour and there's a sign to remind people and um, if there's any other deterrent that people can have instituted to um, try and stop them from, you know, accelerating on the hill and accelerating down the hill with the Boys and Girls Club there at the bottom. There's obviously a lot of children at play, um, and I just feel like there's a real potential for um, some sort of accident or, uh, or bad happening. So I just wanted to make that request before the board tonight. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So um, thank you for coming in. Um, I will um, open up to discussion from the board, but I do just want to lead off by saying I'm, I'm probably not going to vote to send this to TAC. Um, so <laughs> Corey or uh, Corey Rateau, our parking um, officer, um, did re respond to you know what the concerns were, and I, I thought he laid out uh, you know a pretty reasonable response. And I don't think TAC, and I don't want to speak for TAC, but I wouldn't see them altering too much from Corey's recommendations and I think that we've you know if you are if you do watch these meetings we send quite a lot to TAC and we send really big projects and they are um, you know they do get overwhelmed um, by the amount of things we send to them and I just think that this is um, you know Corey's response um, you know did kind of Put, it, put things in perspective for me and makes it think that it doesn't really need to be examined um, further by TAC. But with that, I'd open it up to my colleagues as well and be happy to hear what they have to say. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> in essence, I, I agree with you on, on most of it. I, I would just note one thing that um, part of the request is to change the speed limit, but if I'm not mistaken, we don't have that authority to change speed limits the only thing that we've been able to do in the past has been to put an advisory around a lower speed limit but it has no legal standing that's because because of the state law the state really handy handcuffs uh, local communities um, you know if if other members of the board were were so inclined I might be willing to ask for uh, ask for tax opinion on that one piece of the, the request mm -hmm. um, around an advisory sign um, but I, I think most of the points the chair has made are, are well taken. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Yes, Ms. Mahan. Um, I understand the, the request for the signage, and I live on a little teeny short cut through street between Quincy and Robbins Road, but I'm right near the middle school, um, and amazing the amount of tr number one traffic and speed that they rise up to in such a short amount of distance. There's probably eight, eight to nine, ten houses on each side. And they're probably doing, most people out there think they're doing 40, 50 miles an hour, and then, you know, someone comes out from traffic enforcement, they're doing, you know, 22 at the beginning, 28 at the end. So, um, I, I, so I've never really allowed any of my kids, unfortunately. You know, it's kind of the nature of the times that we live in, um, in terms of um, when I used to play in the streets and you could shoot hockey and, you know, yeah have your basketball unless you live on a cul-de-sac. Some of the other points in here over the past, um, since I've been on the board, they already have been looked at um, intensively by town departments. Um, the bridge, um, which some of it is um,
private land, um, the bridge down by Pond Lane, that was looked at extensively, I want to say, seven to 11 years ago, and the official request was there used to be a sign and or practice that when you went under that bridge, you had to beep and honk your horn, hmm. and it, there was a sign there. And that was the impetus or the starting point for looking at that, and the request was made then in terms of can you make it a one-way, can you put speed bumps in, can you do things like that. And after everything was said and done, it was just sort of signs were taken down, enforcement. When the park was redesigned down by Spy Pond, it kind of came out a little bit more, so that kind of cut down. You didn't really have a freeway. So that issue's been looked at. In terms of speed bumps and the traffic down by the Boys and Girls Club, um, since that is, I guess, their land up there, there are some speed bumps that do close that traffic down there. And again, there was a request by some neighbors who recently moved in there, the Boys and Girls Club, again, within the past 10 years, and the Elks, to look at um, configuring it, whether it's a one-way. Um, and again, we got rec we, we've had people go out and look at this. Um, and for me, I'm all for looking at something again, but I don't think circumstances change. I think we're going to go through the exact um, same exercise. So, um, and with tax requests that they are overburdened, um, to not basically send them a do-over, um, I wouldn't be inclined to refer this. Thank you. Further comments? Um, yes, Mr. Well, I, I'm, I, I heard Joe say this, and I'm sorry, I was reading this at the time. Uh, do we have the authority to change the speed limit? You said you don't think we do. No, I'm pretty sure that we don't as well. I don't believe we do. I mean, I, I could look into alternative options, but I don't think that the selectmen's uh, traffic power is. What the would be the process? Do you know? I believe contact the DOT, and they would have to examine it. Uh, well, I would move we at least do that uh, myself, and I, I agree with Diane, and I, I don't necessarily agree that this uh, this should go to TAC because we're very familiar and have had this before us a number of times before. The only one I can see my way clear to uh, is the uh, put up a speed limit of 20 miles an hour. I couldn't, but uh, we don't have that authority. But I would, I would move that we uh, send a letter to the DOT and start the process for requests that they look at it at, at the very least. Um, so let's get someone looking at it. You know. well, per perhaps we should look in with mm -hmm. look into the pr actual process on how that Agreed. goes because it seems that the there process, has to be uh, there's a you know I we're not 100 percent sure of that so um, yeah perhaps we can c consider it and look into that further after we know the right route to go yeah, down because okay. I think ultimately you have to file legislation because when mm -hmm. the residents of Gray Street wanted 25 miles per hour years ago. What I was directed to was the then senator and the then state rep that it would have to go to the state house and, and get a vote there. And they did put the legislation in, but you know, it wasn't successful. So I think ultimately, I agree with the chairman that, um, and with Kevin, but let's see what the process is. Is it contacting DOT first? But I think what it might be is you have, you know, request to file that legislation. Yes. That so that's right. my motion, uh, you know, that, that we at least let's explore what would be the process and then take further steps from there. But part of that motion would be to Adam to instruct the police to continue a little bit increased patrols and stuff mm -hmm. in that particular area. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm definitely in favor of the, uh, the element of trying to manage this best through enforcement. Because I'm definitely, um, I'm really concerned that piecemeal re, re Redoing street speed limits is something. It's a it's a it's a path that that scares me. I um yeah. But I have no I have no fear. Investigating more and figuring out how to do that process, I have no process problem with. Process Okay. Yes, sir. Please, uh, if you come to the microphone. Again, Kerry Conrad, District Eleven. I'm also uh, a member of the. Town of Arlington Traffic Committee, and I would be glad to perhaps deal with this more organically, take Mr. Chappendale into the committee, have him voice to the people that are closer to this issue. Um, as a father of four, when your kids are playing hockey out in the street and someone that is not part of Arlington drives through the town, which we all have to go through Medford, we all have to go through other towns, 
and we aren't as close to that community as we are to our own. And when those people drive through your streets, um, they sometimes aren't as careful as we are. I know that's a broad brush, but that's why, as Mr. Greeley can attest, I got very vocal with him one day, and he gave it, he said, you know what, no good deed goes unpunished. We're going to put you to work. And I would, I, this is a very close issue to me, when your kids are out in front of the house and they're little, and a car goes zooming by, you know, it's touched us all, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to uh, take that, and uh, if there's no objection. Thank you. That sounds excellent to me, and I appreciate that. That's a good thing you were here. Um, so perhaps you two can, um, you know, take a, have a conversation offline and move forward down that road. But, um, yeah, we Carrie, a, Carrie, excuse me, Carrie got me at a hockey game and had a few, well, yeah, had, had, a, <laughs> had a few issues about traffic. I said, oh, is this something you're interested in? <laughs> so he's now, an, he's now an associate member of TAC, uh, but a very good one. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we have a, um, Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? But nothing. Thank you very much. Um, now, there are some extra bodies here. Is there anything else on the agenda that you were interested in? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to make sure before we got into our policy um, handbook discussion. Oh, that's right. Um, so now, we, if you remember, we did. Um, move agenda item number four to the end of the meeting, which is a uh, discussion concerning the Selectman's Handbook, chapters one through four. Um, so that being said, um, I'd like to open up for discussion. Mr. Greeley. So uh, I would like to um, move uh, that we approve um, chapters one through four with two exclusions. Uh, the history piece, I'm still tracking down uh, um, Richard Duffy to try and get him to write a history of the Board of Selectmen for us if he's willing. And the other one I'd like to take out the code of conduct at this point in time uh, just because I feel we need more work on that and more discussion around it. So I don't feel that's quite complete enough. But otherwise I do uh, move to the board that they approve chapters one through four. And we just owe a huge uh, vote of thanks to uh, uh, Douglas Heim and uh, the kind of work that he really has put into this. Stevens worked hard at it. Um, Andrew, Eve, uh, Marianne Sullivan, a number of people are working on this and helping me put this together to now bring it uh, before you. Uh, but uh, with the board's approval, uh, I move that we approve chapters one through four, uh, excluding history and excluding the code of conduct. Second. They're coming back, it's just at this point in time. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. My name is Joe. Yeah. <laughs> no, but no, oh, oh, Dan yeah. had his. He didn't, he didn't know which one of us got first. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, Mr. <laughs> just one really quick question. So is there anything in, in number three actually that you want us to approve today or is it all through? Th because th I think if we're excluding the code of conduct, that's excluding all of three, is that correct? Oh, three is, it's, it's entirely three is the code of conduct, is yes. that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So it's one, two, and four. Okay. Right. Thank you. So I have some comments, but I'll, I can certainly. Cool. Yeah. Yes, please, Joe. First of all, thank you. I mean, I'm very excited about this. I'm, I'm very excited about the work that, that's been done. I just, I just had two comments on it. Um, I think you have a very good discussion in here of the types of appointments that the board makes, um, appointments that we make directly. Did Where are you? Perhaps, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm sorry. Moving forward, if we, um, I'm, this is nothing against yeah, this, yeah, but maybe fine. if we do give, you know, the page and sections when discussing sure, an sure, issue. Sure, 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 sure. Um, mm, I see I had to do that. I had it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I guess it's, it's around page t 11 and 12. Okay. Um, th th there's a there's a discussion. There are several sections here that deal with the different types of board appointments that are made. There's uh, there are staff appointments. Um, there are those direct appointments that are made um, by the board, including the staff. There are appointments by town manager um, that that um, uh, we approve. There's also the statutory direct uh, appointments. Um, 
This seems to, to be one type that was missing, although maybe it falls under the statutory <coughs> direct appointments. There, there are a couple of types of appointments that we make that, that come down from the general laws that aren't listed here. They're like uh, local cultural councils. That, that actually devolves from a Massachusetts cultural oh. council. Um, there's the Commission on Disabilities as, as two that, that uh, derive from general laws. So I don't know, I know this isn't an exhaustive list, but I didn't know if it made sense to, to include those there. So that's yeah. the only question I had there. Yeah, it is not an exhaustive list, yeah. but we certainly wanted to include uh, the ones that we really are currently filling. Yeah. So, but I'm, so which ones you want to add? The, uh, the Council on Disabilities and the, um, uh, the cultural, the cultural council. council, yeah. Okay. I think Commission on Disabilities is. It, don't you recommend? And we, it, yeah, it, I think and it's a manager we recommendation. We just do a perfunctory yes, but that's a manager. Yeah. And um. But it is. It does come down from state that's, law. That 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 list is in F one. So once the town manager appoints, that we approve is F one. So that one is appropriate to go under F one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. Oh. Okay. And the other. I'm sorry, can I just yes, clarify? Please. Are you saying that, what, are these going under appointments of the town manager or are they going under uh, direct appointments of the board? On page 14, the Commission on Disability Appointment, it should be included there. Under on, the town that, manager appointment. That's not what you were referring to, was it, Joe? Under the town manager yeah, appointment. And then the cultural one, that question's still out there. I think that That's is That question is still out so there. So that needs to be defined. That needs to be okay, defined. So I'm well, not sure the answer on that one. So perhaps we'll look into where well, uh, the cultural like, council appointments, which is why it would be very helpful in the handbook because I don't know the <laughs> I don't know the answer. Sure, I mean we can certainly I, I can certainly look into that, and you know we could even you know have a vote that says you know please. Yeah, we can amend it at any. Yeah, point. That's right. Yeah. We, well, we can amend it at any point, but you could also have a vote that says you know we approve this section subject to addition of uh, appropriate. You know, uh, what's in commissions? Commissions under statute. If there's those two, you want me to specifically look at? I think if the board's comfortable with that, I'm comfortable yeah. with that. Okay. But we agree. Let's add for now commission on disabilities under town manager yeah, appointees that we approve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that we accept that. Thank That's you. fine. Okay. And then the other one that I have um, is in on page 10. It's uh, seniority and proceedings in the absence of board officers. We don't have this situation now, but reading this section, it looks like there is one potential question that ar arises. Um, if it says here that if, uh, let's see, uh, if the two officers are missing, in any board of selectmen proceeding conducted in the absence of the elected chair and the vice chairman, the most senior member of the board in attendance shall preside as acting chairman, which and then there, there are rules for seniority after that. We don't have the situation on the board now. We could have the situation. We'll just be hypothetical. I'm not picking on you, Dan. Let's say Dan leaves. Dan is now the, <clears throat> we now have a junior, junior member in there. Mr. Byrne and I are on the board. Let's say that Mr. Greeley is chair. Ms. Mahan is, is vice chair. The two of you, for some emergency, can't be here. We now have to figure out who's, who's running the meeting. We, we say that the, the seniority is, is dictated by, by vote of the board, but then who's going to run that meeting to, to determine, determine that? So it seems that either, it seems there are one of like three ways we could do it. We could either just say, well, we recognize that and maybe the board administrator is going to run a, an election then to see who's running, but it seems a little odd to do it in the middle of the year. Maybe we could do that at the, either at right. the beginning of the year. But Joe, let me stop you. This situation couldn't happen. It couldn't happen with this board. It couldn't happen, period. If Diana and I, so you used us as an example, right? Correct, correct. This board, right? So Diana and I aren't here. You and Steve can't have a meeting. It's two people. But, no, 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 no. We're saying there's a junior member in the seat. So we're saying if the, if the, <clears throat> if the third and fourth ranking members have equal seniority as Steve and I do. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I, can I the, interject the, for a second? Yeah. Who's the presiding, who's the presiding I, I officer? I think, what, for, and I think what Mr. Cure is raising is a chicken and egg problem. So that Correct. if there are, if the chairman and the vice chairman are missing mm -hmm. and the terms of service does not clearly indicate who's the senior member of the three remaining board members, 
it says that the, a vote of the Board of Selectmen shall determine who's senior. But because there's not a chairman or a vice chairman, there's no one present to conduct that vote. Correct. Um, That's correct. And I think that we can solve that one of two ways. You can either say, at the beginning of the term, the Board of Selectmen you know, shall vote to determine who shall be the senior officer in absence in, in, right. in any situation where you've got two people who have served the same amount of terms. Or we could just put in, for any such circumstance, the uh, board administrator shall conduct the uh, election or should conduct the vote on seniority. Correct. I mean, you could create a position of, of secretary whose job is simply to conduct the meeting if the chair, vice chair, are absent. Hey, Tim. Ms. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yes. What I would, what I, I, this was one of the things actually on my list that I wanted to talk about. What I would prefer is that the seniority in the instance of two individuals being elected at the same time and having saved the same number of total terms is determined by who had the superior number of votes in the previous election. So whoever won at the ballot box is, quote, senior. Mm -hmm. So who had the majority of votes? S superior number. Is that, okay, I'm saying. Majority implies more than 50%. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, yeah. Don't no, I'm just yeah. saying I want to make sure you're not, you're, you know. I'm saying whoever. You know what you're saying, of course. Yes, okay. I'm saying, so in the, in, for example, in the very specific example that we need to determine who was more senior, <clears throat> Steve or Joe, give I an mean, absent their current titles, we would say that it's Joe because he got more votes. Or vice versa. No. Well, in, assuming this the, assuming case, case, in this very specific it's case, it's Joe. Yeah. Can I just ask Doug one question, and I have no problem with that. Um, yeah. The way I'm reading this is that it first defines who the senior member of the board is, then it defines a process that if you go down and the chairman and vice chairman isn't there, and it says if that, the way I'm reading it, it says if that circumstance exists, then it shall be a vote of the board. And the way I'm interpreting that, the board is referencing the now three members who are missing chairman and vice chairman. That's so right. So that's where. Yes. Th so, so. That's correct. So what I'm saying is there's already. So, all right. If you, but if you could work on it because I'm hearing. From Mr. Cura is highlighting a, a, a good point that I don't think we noticed, which is that yeah. there's as I said, a chicken and egg problem wherein how is the vote going to be conducted? Okay, so however you further define Dan's last step. It's a highly time. unlikely s right. situation and it can't happen on this board. Mm -hmm. But there it are happen in the future. there are things that the, t that the chairman sometimes has to do by him or herself. And that's the time where this is really going to kick in. Because they're... What are, uh, so, for instance, um, like the parts where it talks about the role of the chairman, mm -hmm. like uh, sometimes there's an... Er like Or in the event of... Um, like we have a designee to the uh, town emergency uh, committee, and if w that person is unavailable, who's going to be the next selectman appointee to that person? Like that's going to be the time that you want to know just who is the person on this list. And when it's chairman and vice chairman, it's really easy. The third person is where it gets tricky, and I mean, no, it's not super tricky. And the times, that, the number of times that this is going to be invoked is so small. But at the same time, I was saying, you know, give us a rule that we can use every time, no matter what, and. Except it would most likely happen. So then, <laughs> yes, it would, but that's it. Use a rule that it can be invoked every time, no matter what. Mm -hmm. it, so if I may, Dan, yep. what you're recommending then, this is at the top of page 10, right column. Yep. Mm -hmm. Seniority in the, in, in the instance of two individuals being elected at the same time and having served the same number of total terms is determined by the top vote getter. Yep. Although, say it. Superior. Say the words you want. Uh, is determined by who, who got, uh, who received more votes in the previous election. Who received the superior number of votes at the last election? Sure. Superior. Maybe that was what you said. And it's even their previous election because we've already determined that that's the case, and if they have the same seniority. Yeah. <clears throat> I have no objection to that. No, that works. Okay. So that's all. Yeah. Yep. That's fine. Okay. And yes, Mr. Dunn. Um, a couple, a couple more. Yeah. No. Uh, please. So first, I think it's great. My comments here are is improvements over something that is a yeah, great document. Uh, on set with page nine, so four A, board officers and elections. Um, it says last sentence in the left hand column: all five members must be present to hold the annual board of election. I would prefer that we change that word to should. All, as in all five members should, 
And there's two reasons for that. One is in the case of illness, for instance, if one of us is, you know, has a hospital stay or something like that, we don't want to be hung up without having that. And the second thing is that the meeting is fairly long publicized beforehand because it's the first meeting before the election, so that date is set fairly well in advance. And uh, I guess, I, I mean, on some level, we have to rely on the discretion of each other to be smart about how this is, and I'd just rather say should than must mm -hmm. in I this agree. case. Mm -hmm. You do? How do the rest, I don't, but how do the rest of you feel? Yeah, I'm trying to, we, there was a pretty robust discussion on this topic. I'm, I'm trying to remember it. Do you I'd, I'd love to hear it. Mm. This, um, yeah, no, I, mean, I, I just feel this board should choose their chairman. Mm. And because someone misses a meeting, uh, that person didn't have a say in electing the chairman. Um, I mean, I, I really strongly believe in this. The chair and the vice chair serve at the will of this board, as in we could tonight remove Stephen if we wanted. We would never do such a thing, I don't believe. Uh, <laughs> we might wait till Diane is chair again. <laughs> I've been skipped twice. You've done it to me twice. I think that's enough. <laughs> if you want to go back, we can. But, but no, I, but, but thinking at that point, and, and taking it further, if it became four, if we, we don't require all five and there's four, we could have two, two, and again, sign the mm. business. Well, yes. So I'm thinking out loud, okay? Yeah. P perhaps, no, sure. perhaps this is where we would get into voting remotely? Yeah, I was wondering, Dan, would you, if we put in a, a I, I, codicil, is that what it's called? Uh, that uh, if, a, if a member cannot physically be present, their, their vote may be taken. Uh, if people feel really strongly about it, I would rather, uh, I'd rather just leave it as a word and should we get there, cross that bridge. Because mm -hmm. worst case scenario, what you do is you do something crazy. Like, I mean, it's our handbook. It's not a binding bylaw. If, you know, for instance, if we come around to next uh, April and, you know, I'm in the hospital for a month, not that I'm planning on it, but, you know, crazier things have happened then uh, I, I would hope that the board's business would go on. And, uh, but I, I, if you feel really strongly about it, I'm not, I, I, yeah. I don't think Ms. we can do that. Oh, sorry. Mr. Sorry. Heim. Just to, if it helps, it helps smooth things out a little bit. Uh, that is a circumstance in which remote participation could be appropriate. So that might be a possibility that would be available to, to members of the board. I, mm -hmm. I, I would feel pretty strongly about including that. Um, just, because I do think, you know, it, it's an important job is, you know, electing the chairman and vice chairman. And I do think that all five voices should be heard there as well. I, I agree, except I, we don't need to do it here. There, there will be a separate section on remote participation, right? There will be, and I'm not, I mean, we, there will be, and I think we'll put that in there, but we wouldn't even need to in the sense that I believe this body has already adopted remote participation in those types of circumstances, and it's only allowed under the open meeting law in certain situations like a hospitalization. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm ready to move on to the next one. Then, yeah. if I'm, I feel like I, I please, that's right. No, um, I, and I'm happy because this is the discussion yeah. that I was looking for. Uh, pro tem doesn't have a P on it, <laughs> oh. it's still an A. We did go around and about on that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it pro tempore? It is, but it's abbreviated pro tem. So, <laughs> um, I thought the section on tradition. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. My, uh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> original position on that yeah. for the members of the board. <laughs> Why are you so, so sure? You sound very sure. Um, a, uh, three years of Latin. B, I looked it up this afternoon online. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if it's online, it must be true. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, anyhow. I thought the section on the election tradition was very elegantly handled. I thought that was a really good way to, to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, one last suggested change, and that is in C, where we talk about professional expertise. Um, what page are you? I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, it's, I'm looking for it. It was, it was section C, and it was talking about... Um, Okay, left-hand side of page 12. Okay, I scrolled ahead, sorry. Um, so above where it says C1, mm -hmm. it says selectmen as a body may utilize the professional expertise and resources of the town human resource director. I, want to ch I would recommend we choose to change the word may to should because I think we are just in the same sense as the uh, stuff that we talked about in the code of conduct that we're not approving tonight where we say, you know, there are things that we should do that we're not required to. We're not required to use those professional services, but I think that if we don't, we're doing the job wrong. Um, 
I'm, I'm fine with that. that. That works for me. Yeah, I'm fine with that, but I, I owe people drinks. <laughs> What's that? I owe people drinks. I, I told them I didn't think we'd get this through this board, so uh, I was wrong. But I'm fine with should. Right. I really am. I've reached the end of my list. The reason I, I felt we don't need it is I felt it was a duh. But, you know, of course we can use those resources. But you even want to strengthen it, Dan, I understand, too, should. And, and that's okay. I mean, I think uh, yeah. the process Adam has put in place that is followed by uh, Karen in that division is a very strong process, and <laughs> we certainly should adapt it, adopt, adapt, <laughs> adopt it as well. Can I just state my concerns on should? Yes, uh, First of all, we yes, do have a separation between the Board of Selectmen, <coughs> town manager, and his or her department heads, number one. Number two, I don't mind doing that, but even in current case scenario, um, and I've had this conversation with the town manager, and we're working this out, um, in terms of I just want to make sure that we're not boxing ourselves into a process where especially around the actual mechanics and, and functionality of the selectman's office, that we abdicate um, our position in terms of hiring appropriate personnel in there because we have a set of guidelines and we also, you know, the Board of Selectmen's office is inherently and has to be by law separate from town manager and his department heads. And here's my fear. Um, and I'm just going to use case in point with the Board of Selectmen's office that by really abdicating to a process that doesn't really give us a power role, empowerment role, um, and by the process defined by the Human, Rights, Human Resources Director, um, because they don't have the criteria and they don't know the day-to-day -day workings of the Selectmen's office and exactly um, what needs to happen, we could ultimately follow the process that is outlined for town department heads and all the um, diff different positions that the town side, the town manager side and his department heads are aware of, but we could potentially follow the process, do it right, do it their way, and unfortunately not get, and I'm thinking especially around the selectman's office. So I don't know if the manager, because we've kind of been having these conversations anyways. So did you, I don't, I don't want to keep talking if you're going to save me. Yes, please. So I, I think, I don't think there's anything in this language that says the human resources director will take over a search process. And I, I think it talks to the expertise and the resources of knowing how do we administer both the recruitment and issuing a recruitment document, collecting resumes, aiding in review, and then conducting a search process or conducting an interview process. And I think we've made incredible strides in the past year with the HR director, though separate and under the town manager's authority, working with the board of assessors and the treasurer in a search and recruitment process, and having there be no <coughs> abdication of authority, but rather a coordination of resources and using expertise where it exists, this would create a great synergy with what's happened with the Treasurer's Office and the Board of Assessors Office, and I, I, I personally think it would be very important to maintain. And I, I don't think there's any statement of abdication, uh, because the Board would absolutely be the appointing authority, and I wouldn't expect them to ab abdicate any of that authority in following the process. Okay, so I was on the understanding in past practice that that wasn't the case. What, what you and I have discussed that with this office. But, but you know what, you can change it to whatever you want and then this is a document that is gonna be before us over the course of the next nine to 12 months if my concerns still relay out <coughs> after conversations with Mr. Grayley and, and um, Mr. Chapdelaine, um, then we can come back and revisit it. So I'm happy to do what the majority of the board wants to do. Okay, I, and I, I, thank you, Diane. And I will agree that um, going back to remember the coordinated finance uh, stakeholder group that we were working on, that was a pretty big part of um, you know the discussion. It was trying to get everyone on board <coughs> and kind of break down those silos across town. And I am, um, and I agree that you know while we don't want to give up the authority to make these choices, I think that you know. And I don't think that saying should necessarily means that we will always do exactly what they want, but it says that you know there's a, you know some assets there that are probably helpful to us, and they can be helpful moving forward, and uh, they're something that we should consider. So, um, so I think that that's a majority um, going the other way down to that. Sorry. Um, 
where were we? Further um, issues? No, nope. I think Dan has been waiting ahead of me. No, I'm good, thank you. Oh, I thought that you... I, I'm, I, oh, yes, Diane I'm fine, has thank changed you. my mind back to let's leave it at May utilize. All right, now I'm ready. <laughs> Let me tell you why, if I may, Dan. Of course. Uh, because uh, it is not technically what we did in selecting the town manager. Each member of this board named a person to a committee that we put together to review, and we did use Karen, I believe, yes. right. to review, uh, 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 what, what's the word I'm looking for? Screen, uh, the screen uh, resumes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then bring before us candidates, and then we conducted into, then we, uh, but it, it's not, the, we really entirely drove that process on all three of the town managers that I've been part of in terms of that replacement. So we did utilize them though. We did utilize Karen. So, uh, or I don't know if Karen was the first one when we, whoever was in that position. We, we had Karen each time. We had Karen all three times? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, but I like that each member of this board got to name one person to be mm -hmm. on the screening committee for us. So uh, anyhow, I, I'm back to may utilize versus should. So, sorry. You know, it, it's just, it's interesting to me that uh, you, because I actually was, I was gonna use the exact same argument. I was gonna say when we hired Adam, we did utilize the resources of the personnel department. And I think that, that was, we did it appropriately and we held our authority the whole time. Right. And so to me, that's, we, so we did use those things and we should have done that and we should do it in the future. And that's why, and so it's, it, it, we, we have the exact same example, but we've reached different apparently different conclusions, yeah. which is, because I, I, what, we, what we've done in the past, and we don't have to yeah. do this in the future, or our future board doesn't, it's been a two-part process. The first part involved Karen and the committee, their recommendations. Then it came to this board, mm -hmm. but then with the caveat, this has been done in the past, doesn't have to be done in the future, that the board was welcome to take all those recommendations, or some of them, and what was exercised in the past um, with Mr. Sullivan and a former colleague, Mr. Lyons, um, we can accept all the recommendations as a whole, or accept some of them, but the more important salient point was we can accept the five recommendations from that initial screening committee, but if there was somebody who applied mm -hmm. for a position and a member of this board of selectmen said they didn't make the cut from Karen and her committee, but we would like to um, advance them forward to be interviewed. Um, so to me, using the word should and what you just described is still completely compatible because we're still using that re professional resource. If, Joe, if I'm just gonna keep going, going just for one minute. The one, the specific example that I would have in mind for Arlington and its recent history is uh, in the school department where the town, uh, there's a personnel decision made that did not in involve proper use of professional um, staffing advice. And that has cost the town dearly. And if it's one lesson that I think we should learn from that, it's that we need professional, when we as a board in particular, because none of us are paid well enough to be a human resource professional, we should make use of that. And if we don't, that's the thing that I'm most, I'm not trying to get some, I, when I say should, I'm not in particular trying to give away the power that the board has, because I really think that we should hold on to that. And which is why in particular, where we say, um, the hiring and supervision of all board appointed employees is firmly vested within the board. And the selectman as a body should utilize the professional experiences. Like I'm not aware, I'm not worried about giving away too much power, but I really do think that using that professional stuff is what inoculates us against making some terrible mistakes. So I wonder, um, I, sorry, one section. I do think um, pretty soon we're just gonna take a vote on this. Sure. I would oh, like yeah. to hear of what course. Joe thinks, right. and then right. I think right after that we should have a motion. And, and then someone should storm out and rage. I think that'd be perfect, <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, uh, remembering, if I may, Mr. Chair, just I already have a motion on the board to accept all this, so mm -hmm. he would have to move to make an amendment, that's yes. all. Thank you. Mr. Kiro. Because I'm not friendly accepting it. Go Noted. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna suggest language that maybe would be friendly to, to both of you. You know, shall utilize the, the resources as deemed appropriate by the board. That makes clear that, that the, the judgment is still vested with the board. Say it again, Chuck. Yeah, I mean, 
do. Shall, so, shall uh, the the secular women have does another. I think add, uh, if I may, if correctly understood, it would be uh, adding to the end of that sentence as deemed necessary by the board. But he's putting in shall instead well, of should, uh, and instead of may. So, oh. did you? I think when you put the clause as deemed necessary by the board, it almost doesn't matter what the verb is. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. I move that we change the word may to should in the sentence preceding C1. Do we have a motion? I uh, mean, do we have a second? I'll second it. We have a motion, a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Joe, did you vote? Yes, I oh, said aye. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's three to two. It's being changed. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, I quit this whole process. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one more small thing that I yes. just noticed. I'm I sorry. Dan still got stuff. Oh, do you? No, that was it. Oh, End of my list. Yes. Okay, sorry. No, I, this, this, hopefully this is just very quick. Um, page 13, D1, reappointments of, of direct appointees <laughs> and holdover appointees. Mm -hmm. we, we note here that the, that the board through its office notifies uh, the appointees, but then there's a discussion of holdover appointees continuing on with their duties, but there's no um, uh, requirement placed upon us to act in a timely manner. This, um, if I remember, this is something that we were yes. speaking of um, after, and it, it was kind of um, a last minute thing that we didn't probably devote as yeah. much attention to as um, we should have during the meeting, but. Can I just speak on this quickly? Uh, obviously the, the process that's outlined here is what should be done that you know all this stuff should be done in a timely fashion yeah i think what this holdover piece is trying to acknowledge is that every once in a while something might fall through the cracks sure. and it'd be helpful to know what should happen in that event sure that there's a lot of folks that this board appoints even more than the town manager appoints although it doesn't cover that and in the event that for whatever reason uh the term technically expires but it has not been filled with someone new. Right. This is the process by which the board would deal with that situation. And there's a couple of scenarios where that might happen that it's not even a mistake by the board. There's just a meeting gets canceled that would have otherwise happened but for a power outage at town hall, things like that. It protects us all. It protects us all. I, I just would feel comfortable if we had a statement in there that the board, the board shall act on all reappointments in a timely manner. I was, I'm fine with that. Just, yeah. I think if we <coughs> determine a time, because I know we had it, I think it was with Ed Choi. He basically said, I'm, I'm done right now, but I'll stay here. And it had something to do with the Sims um, project. I'll stay here until you find somebody. We went through the process and we weren't comfortable. And he was allowed to, you know, so if, if it's general that it's not saying within 90 days, I'm fine with that. I just want to make sure we have the wording, the verbiage that allows us to do that. Because he was kind enough to say to let us right. do it some more because he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm, my memory is correct. So I'd, I'd like to move to add that sentence, the board shall act on all reappointments in a timely manner. I'm, I accept that. Yeah, I'm happy with that too. Where would you like that inserted, Mr. Chair? At the end of D1. The end of D1? D1. Unless, did you say you wanted even more specific? No, no, I said I didn't that, want a specific attitude, okay. for that case in point. I was just trying to give a case in point. Okay. So that is D1. Um, are you all, all set? All mm -hmm. set, Ms. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. Greeley. I am tingling with excitement. I move that we, <laughs> with all the amendments that have been uh, voted and uh, accepted, uh, we accept chapters uh, one, two, and four, with the exclusion of the history of the part of chapter one. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is anyone in the audience um, would like anything to say on this? Seeing none, um, I would like to say I was really, I thought that was great. Good. Um, <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was, uh, I'm hoping that this goes you like. You are an interesting dude. <laughs> um, and uh, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Steve, you may be in the right career. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh boy. Moving on to correspondence we received. received. Um, uh, we, uh, yes, and I would just, would just like to point out that with the uh, digital speeding device request from Ms. Gaffney, um, I have spoken with her individually and we are kind of examining that request and we'll report back. Awesome. Um, so we have a motion to move receipt. Do we have a second? Second. Second and congratulations on the grant. Yes. 
All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Got nothing vote. Thank you, everyone. New business. Ms. Sullivan. Nothing. No. Mr. Heim? Uh, I have two small matters of new business. I'll be quick. Uh, one is that I wanted to let the board know that the next section of the Selectman's Handbook that we're working on is meetings and hearings, which covers agenda, public participation, meeting procedure, and minutes. If there's any comments that the board members would like to advance to me or Ms. Sullivan in advance of sort of working on these drafts, we'd welcome them. Uh, the second is a minor, th uh, well, somewhat of a minor thing that I wanted to apprise the board of. Uh, the board may recall that there was a lawsuit filed against the town of Arlington, Juliana Rice, and Joseph uh, Julia Mary. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, the court uh, granted the town summary judgment in all accounts. Uh, while there is an appeal process in that matter, uh, at present we're Excuse me. looking in good shape on that on that front. Were all the parties granted, or just us? That's right. All the parties in the uh, all the defendants. Thank you, Mr. Chaplin. Good. Sorry, thank you. Yes. Uh, very briefly, uh, town for the second year in a row uh, has received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award from the Governmental Finan uh, Finance Officers Association for the town manager's financial plan. Credit for that really goes to Andrew Flanagan. Uh, so it's, uh, for the it was for the first time last year it was awarded, and I think it's, from what I understand, it was, it's tougher for us to keep it for the second year, so I was very happy we were able to uh, do that. Second, uh, I think as the board knows, we had uh, the entire traffic signal at the intersection of Mass Ave and Route 60 in front of Cambridge Savings Bank uh, collapsed during the Nor'easter last week. Uh, you've probably seen the temporary lights that are up still working with DPW to figure out what the schedule is for the erection of a more permanent light fixture. Uh, I know Ms. Mahan has mentioned to me the need for potentially supplementing those temporary lights with signs if we don't have something moving faster, so I'm going to keep an eye on that uh, so that we are controlling the intersection as appropriate while the temporary lights are there. Not to go into great detail, the problem really is the big pole that the lights go on uh, are not that easy to come by. Uh, so we're trying to find a used one uh, that another City of Town is decommissioned. Getting one that's the right size with the right bolt pattern uh, that I learned today is very difficult. If we can't find a used one, it's a 60-day lead time to get a new one. So uh, there's more to come there, and I'll let the board know what the status is. But just wanted to give you an update on the traffic lights that are currently sitting in barrels on the corners of Mass Ave. And Could I, give on that, Thank you very that's much. just my one piece of new business, which piggybacks that. Yes. The, the request that. Um, in terms of the signs is if this is going to be a long-term thing not fixed in the next couple of weeks because of We had to deal with what we get for signage a lot of people are taking that right-hand turn and the reason to put No turn on red you're still 50% of the traffic probably will, will start to obey to No turn on red, but 50% is still going to say they don't have that dedicated arrow but having that sign there just by the nature of people in, in cars when they do see people crossing at the walking across, I think it will tend to make them stop more, let them go, and then continue on through and take that right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and several people had asked if the, the town could do that. But if the town manager or Mr. Rademacher thinks there should be some other wording or verbiage on the signs to address that, I'm fine with that. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chaplin. I'm good. You're good? Mr. Greeley. Yeah, just uh, one quick one, and it, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't call Adam on this, but Adam, um, can I ask, do you know, around the Thompson School, is that project considered complete? And the reason I ask that is a couple of residents of North Union Street asked whether or not there's more paving to be done on North Union Street. Is there or are you being? Oh, I mean, so not the school, but the, the street the paving street, project? North Union, yeah. You know, I, I would have to look at the paving schedule to see if we have it in the contract for next year. I know there was a lot of gas work, so let me check and Yeah, I just didn't it. know whether or not it was related to the final rebuild of the Thompson or not, and I should call you on that. There was gas work related to Thompson. I, I can okay, look at that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Yaros. Mr. Mr. Dunn. Three items, believe it or not. Oh. I know. Um, <laughs> first off, uh, just as was mentioned, uh, long-term planning committee did meet uh, this week. Uh, wow, last week, excuse me. And um, no, no decisions or anything like that, but we're definitely talking about uh, the budget 
in particular for the next uh, the upcoming cycle that we're going we're to kick off this winter, and talking about uh, the long term plan, like the five year cycle and how that meant. So no decisions, but definitely research and discussion going on on that. Um, number two, this is our last meeting before an election, so I just want to remind everybody, November 4th, Tuesday, which is a week from now, we've got uh, <laughs> elections coming up, and so everyone should remember to do that. And last one, let's see if you can cross this one off too, Joe. Twice. Um, that, I saw this on the Arlington email list, and as someone who rode crew, as I refer to it, 60 pounds ago, uh, congratulations to the Arlington Belmont crew who took away the championship trophy at the Massachusetts Public School Rowing Association Fall Championship. The boys, novice, and varsity teams took place, and the girls took the second highest point, to point totals. Um, so congratulations to them. Third year in a row. Fantastic. Great news. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Mr. Thank you. I'll try to make it real quick. Um, first of all, uh, the manager and I were, uh, last week, um, we went to the regional um, legislative breakfast, the Mass Municipal Association. It was held in Bedford um, this time. They do them twice a year in, in, um, in each, each region. Um, a lot of different things of relevance to us was discussed because there were about five or six legislators there, including Alice Peich, who's the education, House Education Chair. So there was some discussion of uh, Minuteman. The message was very loud and clear that uh, we're all going to have to get our acts together uh, before we're going to get the, the state to listen to us, the MSBA, uh, you know, and to really push any project forward. Um, there was a lot of discussion on the foundation budget um, as well, and uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail there. Two things of maybe more immediate relevance to us. Um, there was, uh, maybe it was partly because we were in the, the first uh, CPA community and in the first project that they had, which is the Old Town Hall. and. In Bedford, there was a discussion about what the, legis the legislature and how they're approaching the funding issues that uh, Mr. Foskett uh, mentioned when he, he came up earlier uh, this, this, this evening. So they, they're clearly taking that seriously. And um, there was a lot of disappointment about the state's economic development package. I don't know if um, one of the things that the MMA was pushing for hard was to give cities and towns independent authority over these caps on the liquor licenses at the restaurants and it failed this year just so we don't have to go through this dance that we just went through with town meeting we're going to be going through when uh, our restaurants uh, run out so they're going to make another run at that i think this year um, it seemed to be pretty high um, on, on the list so i just wanted to report that back um, Two, two special events last, last week. There was the Chamber of Commerce had their um, recognition banquet, and they um, recognized our fire department and our uh, police department um, uh, for all that they do for the town. We're obviously very uh, proud of them, um, as well as a number of uh, local business. Cambridge Savings was always our lead on town day and does so much. Uh, Barbara Popolo, who you know, has organized the Center Merchants, as well as um, Bob Bowes and Maureen Gormley for their service to the, the chamber. And uh, on Friday night was the... Um, the night out on the town, which uh, supports the um, Arlington Youth um, Counseling Center, uh, Mr. Lyons came back and gave a nice remembrance of, of Dr. Foley. Um, and there was also a brief remembrance of um, Malachi Shaw Jones, who was one of our Board of Youth Services members, who passed away in um, August and uh, was a wonderful guy. And um, so um, there was a lot, a lot of good stuff going I think on. He was there last year, as a matter of fact. He certainly was. He certainly was. Um, so um, a lot of good stuff going on in town this past week. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Carroll. Um, and one of the best parts of going last is that most get eaten up. So um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. It's a second. Sorry. All those in oh, favor, please on. say aye. Aye. aye.